Welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rocky Rod Alive! everybody welcome to pop culture philosophers in particular welcome to rock and robbie live here on a sunday night i am your host rock and robbie bill station pop pop boom this is the place where we gather and talk about comics movies pop culture and a whole lot more we took last week off but we are back 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 again ready to just jive it out tonight talking about all kinds of stuff including some x-men 97 i'm open to talk about it i have watched the first two episodes we will be having the dc sneak peek we will also be talking about ghostbusters frozen empire i went and saw that today i'll give you my honest review and thoughts and opinions in a non-spoilery way we got a new bit where maybe i'll go in and read some old comments or some more recent comments from the channel and answer them directly since i'm terrible 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 at responding to com uh, comments um show and tell maybe a sneak preview of the next top down that all depends on certain things certain factors um also the reveal a pcp movie nights lineup for april as well as may and june that's right i'm revealing the entire cruise choice lineup tonight here on rock and robbie live even though we have a grand plan, grandiose and, and majestic, some may even call it. This show is driven, fueled, if you will, by your questions, your thoughts, your comments, and your concerns. So get them in right now. You out there in the chat, once you pop into the room, throw out a boom, 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 pop, pop, boom, I should say, so that we know zoom, 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 you're in the room. I need to come up with a better bit than that. Anyway, super excited to be here. I had a nice, relaxing weekend. Um, did some shows over the weekend. I was on Dylan's Horror Show last night. We talked about a Lamberto Bava film, A Blade in the Dark. That was a really good show. Um, Friday, what did I do Friday? Friday, I had a wonderful Friday evening, spending it with some, uh, with a very, uh, cherished person. Let's just say that. Um, uh, Thursday night, we recorded our Black Swan review. That's going to be on Blood Slider Chatter this upcoming Thursday for, um, of course, um, What's that called? March Madness is what we're doing. Um, also, Thursday night is going to be the best comics of the month stream. Uh, me and a uh, esteemed panel of YouTube guests will be there. But I will say this. You should follow Pop Culture Philosophers on Instagram. And if you're on Facebook, join the PCP Army. That's the official Pop Culture Philosophers Facebook group. You can follow me on Twitter at the Rockin' Robbie, And, of course, you can support the channel with the Super Chat, which will lead to the goal of a special sneak peek at an upcoming video. 
Um, one of my top down, bottoms up videos. I got one loaded up and ready, depending on where the super chats lie. So uh, just let me know if you want to see them. Also, check out our website, popculturephilosophers.com, where you can find links to merch and everything. And also, you can support the channel at patreon.com slash PCP, like these fine PCP patrons right there. And in April, we are starting a what I hope to be a monthly gathering on Patreon to watch along a movie. So if you're interested in that, check it out at patreon.com slash PCP. That's going to be available for all the $5 and up patrons there. But all we really need is your support being here, liking, sharing, subscribing, participating in the conversation. Now we are in the midst of, whoop, that's the wrong, <laughs> that's the wrong button. We are in the midst of, of March Madness, and tomorrow night on PCP Movie Night, we're going to be talking about Spiral, 2007 film, not the one with Chris Rock that's part of the Saw franchise, so join us for PCP Movie Night tomorrow night. Manny, this week is going to be dropping gigantic, more demonic splendor when superheroes and demons collide. A look at Ghost Rider, the Spectre, and we have demons. He just did a live today talking about uh, ranking the Exorcist franchise. That was a really cool video. I checked out some of it. You can also catch me Thursday night for the Blood Splatter Chatter finale of March Madness as we talk about Black Swan. It's me and Easy Dick, Eric, and Verno. It's such a great show, such a great movie to talk about. And the grand finale of March Madness 2024 over at Dylan's Horror Show. Join me and Dylan and the crew as we talk about possession, possession, possession. Once again, tomorrow night, March Madness continues with Spiral. At some point this week, Manny's going to be doing When Superheroes and Demons Collide, a look at Ghost Rider, The Spectre, and We Have Demons. On Blood Splatter Chatter, you can check me out with the crew over there Thursday talking about Black Swan. And on Dylan's Horror Show, the grand finale of March Madness 2024, Possession, Possession. We now pause for station identification. Well, we did just spoil the first reveal of PCP Movie Night, so I'll go ahead and just get that one out of the way. April 1st, PCP Movie Night, our first post-March Madness show. It's a week from tomorrow. We're going to be talking about cats to fulfill a promise that we made before the pandemic. So, four years in the making, we're finally going to watch and review cats. That should be interesting. All right, everybody, cheers. I'm, your boy's on his bourbon kick again. So let's take a look at the chat. Let's take a look at what everybody's saying. We got GT Key Comic in the house. Chill out man says, vape, charge, blunt, roll, no beer. I'm broke as hell, but I'm not going to let that get me down. Station, everyone. Now that's the kind of positive mental attitude we like around here. We call it the PMA. Artists formerly known as Jesse say, what? It's that time again. Station, station to all the people all over the world. Rogue Collecting says, station, everyone. Rogue Collecting says, Rock and Robbie, have you heard about the Ed Piscor drama screenshots? What are your thoughts? I'm surprised there. I haven't seen more talk about it. Looks like Ed and cartoonist Kayfabe's IGs are currently down, but Jim is still up. No idea what we're talking about there. What's going on with Ed? Hopefully nothing too severe. I hope. Anissa, what is up, Station? Eddie is in the house. Station, I feel gutted by the Ed Piscor situation. I hope he gets ahead of it and owns it. Saying nothing is great. Isn't great. What the fuck's going on with Ed Piscor? Someone let me know. Our Ariaga in the house. We got Boat in the house. Pickle Pals. We like Pickleball. What's up with those? Everybody's all of a sudden, like, obsessed with Pickleball. Like, what the shit is that about? Like, does anybody understand this? Like, I was with my lady eating a burger one day. And I was like, they're playing pickleball on the TV? And now everywhere I go, all around town, I see people like, we now have pickleball at our gym. We now have pickleball at this athletic center. What, What's going on? Where's this pickleball fad come from? It's weird. No offense if you're a pickleball professional player. Nice alliteration. Thank you. The name changes in the house. Two good Pedros in the house. Pew, pew. How you doing, my man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Anissa says, dab is packed. Alcohol is poured. Let's get it. <laughs> Here's to it. Let's, let's get it. Let's get it. I had the craziest. You ever like somehow something triggers in your YouTube or Spotify algorithm and it plays a song that you haven't heard or even thought about 
in a very, very long time. That happened to me today, and I've been stuck on this one album from my teenage years. I don't think it's their first album, but the Godsmack album with the orange-haired chick on the front. I've been listening to that shit all day. Now, back when that album came out, I remember going to... This used to be a big deal. Just like New Comic Book Day, we got Wednesday Warriors. We used to be... Tuesday Warriors for movies and music, right? So we would go to like Best Buy or our local shops. We had a local music shop that we used to go to called CD Exchange. And um, I remember we would go there and just pick up whatever's at, what's out this week? Oh, there's a new Radiohead album. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's these U CDs. Oh, cool. Like some Pink Floyd that I've never re- uh, listened to. So just stuff like that. I kind of miss those days you know, as far as music goes, but I also love the one-stop shop approach to music, which seems to be, it seems to work better than the movie shit. They seem to got that figured out. Maybe they don't pay their artist. I've heard lots of things, this and that versus Spotify versus this rights holder, Amazon, Apple, whatever the hell, right? But at least most of what I want to listen to, I can access on my Spotify account, like on my, in my car, in my house, at work. That's, that's pretty cool. That's what everybody thinks that video streaming is supposed to be, but that's not, in fact, what video streaming is. Um, imagine if you had to get a bunch of different music uh, uh, platforms to like hear everything. You're like, oh well, this one only has this many 311 albums on it, and if you for the other ones, you got to go to the other streaming service or whatever. But anyway, I guess all that to be said. So I used to go, and I remember godsmack when they first got big i don't think this was their first album i think they had one before it. i'm not sure but me and my homies we were all into it we were all into godsmack right and then there's a pretentious snobby robbie kind of comes out and all of a sudden you start learning more about older music and start diving deeper into current music and you start like trying to pull away from the mainstream you start like talking shit about the stuff that you used to like um but then you get to a certain age where you don't give a shit, and all of a sudden, instead of being annoyed by Hanson, Mbop, every time it comes on, you're actually singing along, and it's got a nostalgic factor to it. That being said, I think that Godsmack album fucking slaps. I'm not even lying. Just go away. I'm, I'm not even kidding. I was like, I was jamming. I was jamming. On the way to Ghostbusters, on the way back, doing laundry, rocking out to Godsmack. No lie. I was in the car wash today. I was in the car wash today, pull, pulling on some, and uh, just enjoying the lights and some Godsmack. Anybody remember that Godsmack album? Just go away. <laughs> All right, Nine Panel Grid, what is up? That's easy, Dick Eric, right there. Great channel, everybody. Go sub up Nine Panel Grid. He's been doing weekly reviews that are magnificent, absolutely fantastic. So good and actually encouraging and awe inspiring. And it actually, it actually has gotten me to be like, man, I, I, I need to be better because Eric's really good at what he's doing. So everybody go sub up nine panel grid. I think he's got a new video dropping tomorrow for the books of last week. Yeah. Ariaga, what is the situation with Epis score? What's going on here? Hey, what's up? Introspect him. There were screenshots posted today with him apparently grooming a minor. Ooh. What's up, Derek? Gummies 8, Bong Blazed. Rogue Collecting says, uh, screenshots of him PMing a 17-year-old and offering for her to stay at his place, calling her good girl and naughty girl. Weird shit a 40-year-old shouldn't be saying to a 17-year-old. Whoa. That's, uh... That's disheartening to fucking hear, to be honest. I'm a big fan of Ed Piscor's work, and I'm a huge fan of the cartoonist Kayfabe channel. So if this shit's true, that's fucked. That's pretty fucked. Hmm. I hope it's not true, but at the same time, if it is true, that's fucked. Hey, what's up, Circumstances? Circumstances says, went and saw Ghostbusters last night. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. And like Circumstances says, lovingly caress that like button. Man, that really sucks to hear about Epic Score. I wonder if they're going to be dropping Cartoonist Kayfabe this week then. Hmm. What should he do? Is it true? If not true, he should fucking come out and say something. But if there's screenshots, then there's that. That's pretty fucked up. 17? Damn. 
Man, that's unfortunate as fuck. Derek says, X-Men 97 is pure uncut dope. Is that good? <laughs> I have thoughts about X-Men 97. I don't think they're going to be popular thoughts. James, what is up? Man, I'm bummed out hearing about that Ed Piscore shit, dude. That's like disheartening as fuck. I was all like gung-ho excited to do a show. Damn. I hope it's not true, but if it's true, I mean, fuck, dude. You better do the right thing and stop doing that shit and fucking own it. That's rough. Neighborhood Merc says, Station, I felt like I was 11 again watching X-Men 97. All right, all right. Jay Burns is in the house. Cats, horrifying. Yeah, yeah. Too Good Pedro says, always down for a watch party. Chill Out Man says, not the spiral with Chris Rock. Thanks so much. Yeah, we covered that already. I'm not going to put the gang through that one again. <laughs> hey, what's up, BJ? How you doing? Station, good to see you. Hey, what's up, Hammer Time? I sent you the list today and you didn't respond, so I guess you don't want to be on any of them. It's okay. But I miss you, brother. Eric says, This week has been excellent. Great comics, X-Men 97, and Ghostbusters. Hammer Time says, For your information, I was building a fence all day at my parents' house. Going back out tomorrow if you want to help build a fence. Unfortunately, brother... I got to work tomorrow. I've got to go to the deep. I got FOC. Um, I got pulls to do. I got a lot of stuff I got to do tomorrow. Monday's a busy day. And then I got my dynamite show. And then I got PCP movie night. Um, sorry, brother. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, I'm bummed out too, Eric. Eddie, that's really, that's shitty news. I like the Godsmack song, Keep Away, says Frankenfrog. I'm doing the best I ever did. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm doing the best I ever did. Now go away. I don't know, man. It was just hitting me right this today for some reason. I hadn't listened to that shit in forever. Forever. Dwayne's a pain with the super chat. Thank you so much. Pop, pop, boom. <laughs> of pain thank you so much for the super chat and the support it really does help us out tremendously here in pcp land thank you anissa says hey robbie would you ever think about covering trade paperback in omnibus books i would love it um 100 there's going to be some collected editions that i'm going to be doing some top downs on uh top down bottom ups uh bottom ups bottoms up top down bottoms up um 
the my top down flip through comics. I'm going to start there. There's some collected editions that I'm planning on doing. Omnibuses maybe not so much because I don't really have a lot of omnibuses. The ones I did have I kind of got rid of um, because I would prefer just to get the original comics or like just a nice floppy that's easy to like travel with and and hold on to and and read without like hurting my fucking arm or something like that. But yes, definitely. And if there's any collected trade paperbacks things like that you want to see, just let me know. Opinions on The Roadhouse. Three you digs for me. I thought McGregor was a little over the top, says R. Ariaga. Have not watched it yet. I do plan on watching it maybe Thursday night because we are going to be doing a review about it on our, uh, our Dynamite show on Friday. So the show that I do with Rex and Amy from Dynamite, that's going to be the subject of this week's show is we're going to be doing a review on The New Roadhouse. And I want to ask Bueller if he wants to join us, but I'm afraid that he's just not even going to watch it because he's so against it. Eddie says, thanks to your recommendation, I went back to my shop and got that huge Batman facsimile, so thanks for that. They unfortunately didn't have the foil anymore, but it is huge. Yeah, it is huge, and man, that foil is so cool on it. Cobra Commander was dope, BJ. I agree. That was awesome. Two Gun Pedro says, that super chat will help Robbie get new physical, new shelves for his physical media. It is something that I need is new shelves for my physical media. We were talking about that last night on Dylan's Horror Show. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Plus, for the upcoming movie watch-alongs, there is still like a little cord that I need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in here in the chat a link to our PCP Studio Upgrade Amazon wish list. There are a few more things on there. If you feel so inclined and you can help, and you feel like you want to, please do. But if not, just being here is support enough, y'all. Seriously, thank you so much. And thank you for the reminder, Two Gun. I do need some shelves. There's shelf on that list, too. Because I need a Blu-ray shelf and I need... I need like a massive VHS shelf. The the VHS are, they're like the little Stay Puft dudes in the Ghostbusters movie now. They're just all over the fucking place. Just all over the place. Hey, we got Stu from Dr. Doom's fan club in the house station. Station Robbie and good evening. Station to all you beautiful people tonight. William says, does it include Marvel Essentials and DC, DC Showcase Presents? I have some Marvel Essentials. I don't have as many as I used to. I got rid of them, unfortunately. But definitely something that, uh, like, I have all the Tomb of Dracula ones. I got all the Monster of Frankenstein ones. I got, I think I still got the Howard the Duck. Please tell me I didn't get rid of the Howard the Duck. I got rid of the fucking Howard the Duck. Damn it. I think I, I got the Godzilla. And I got the Punisher. I got Spider Woman. I got Thor. I got Daredevil. I got Ghost Rider. Showcase. Um, I have like Hawkman. I have Aquaman. That's what I have on those. But if I can get a hold of them for sure, I love the essentials. I'm going to pin that list up top. There is an RCA to 3.5 millimeter. That's what I need. Then we can start doing the watch parties on the Patreon. Jay says, can't wait to hear Rex's thoughts on Roadhouse. LOL. Yeah, me neither. Derek says, to clarify, pure uncut dope is fantastic. Mike Sykes says, I uh, can recommend The Displaced. Number two, that book is cooking. Yeah, I liked it too. Last week was a pretty solid week. This week is shaping up to be a good week too. For sure. Nine Panel Grid says, Totally agree, Mike. Displaced has been great so far. Hey, what's up, Mad Bomber? Uh, Robbie, have you ever done a collection tour video? No. But once that corner right there is tightened up, Yes. Until then, no. Because <laughs> right now, you'd just be seeing random stacks of comics, and I'd be like, everything in the boxes are in order. Everything that's not in a box is not in order. <laughs> so I want to like, I want to tighten that, in, that, that area a little bit. 
Need some K-Lock shelves for some omnibuses, says Austin. Anissa says, really looking forward, really looking for the collected edition reviews. I'd love any arc you'd recommend. I usually like women lead action stories. Supergirl, Cassandra, Black Widow, but I'm a new reader, so I'm missing out. All right, all right. BJ says, Robbie, if I buy this, if I buy and collect the single issues each month and afterward, if I plan to buy the collected edition or deluxe edition, what do I do with those single issues? You can keep them, you can sell them, or you can give them away. It's that simple. But it's, it's what do you want to do? Do you have the space to keep them? Do you want to keep them? Because sometimes single issues, like for modern comics, I don't know so much, but like I like the stuff that I collected when I was a kid. I like having that or the older stuff. I like... I don't like, you know, y'all going to hear way too much now on this top-down movie or uh, comic review stuff that I'm doing because I don't really like how a lot of old-school comics get transferred into new paper with gaudy coloring. So I've been more back into, like, diving into old-school stuff, uh, getting the floppies, right, over the trades, for instance. But there's plenty of stuff that I do have just trades of, and... There are things that I have trades and singles of, and there are things that I get singles of, then I get the trade, and I usually sell them or give them away. Anissa says, I'm so sad the new Black Widow book didn't get the Robbie stamp of approval. Shaking my head, a modern Red Room story would kill if written and right. Yeah, it just didn't work for me. You know, I like the character of Black Widow. Um, if you've never read the Greg Rucka stuff, from Black Widow. I would highly recommend that. I do believe at some point they put out a collected edition. Marvel's notoriously bad for not keeping things in, in print, right? So I don't know if it's still available, but it's like the Marvel Knights, Black Widow run, Greg Rucka, then Devin Grayson did some as well. That was a cool little run. That's where we kind of get introduced to, uh, what's her name? Yelena, Yelena, right? And then, um, I would also highly recommend, if you haven't read, the Mark Way Chris Samney run, which I believe is also in a trade. I don't know if it's still in print, but Mark Way Chris Samney on Black Widow, that's a really solid, like, 12-issue run. All right, now let's get this show officially started with your very own... All right, we're going through the Joe Jusco Marvel Masterpieces Series 1. We're on card 21, which happens to be the Enchantress. Joe Jusco's known for his sexy women. And the Enchantress needs to be portrayed as a sexy-ass woman, and she is, 100%. One of my favorite personal characters over at Marvel, Elektra. And that's a nice, like, bootylicious Elektra right there. I kind of dig it. I really do. I don't have the first appearance of Elektra. I want the entire Frank Miller Daredevil run in single issues, and I don't have them. I just have random ones. I have like 181. I think I got like 183. I have to look and start piecing that run together. Of course, her first appearance is probably going to be the most expensive of the lot. All right, then we got Electro. That's a pretty dope one, too. He's Jack, dude. Electro's been hitting them deadlifts. <laughs> then we've got Doctor Strange. That's an all right one. It's okay. Right? I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's not as dynamic as some of the other ones. Here's one that's vividly emblazoned in my head from when I was a kid. Dr. Octopus. That's a dope one right there. And for a pudgy dude, he's Jack too. That's just, how, that's just how it is. So out of all these, it's really tough. My favorite out of these five, it would be an easy pick to say Electra, just because that's bootylicious. But... I will have to go with the dynamic quality and the nostalgic memory that I have attached to this Dr. Octopus. So, there you go. And that has been your official and very own. First five. All right, let's take a look at the chat. Uh, you are welcome, Anissa. I appreciate you. Stu says, love the Wade and Samney Widow, and Kelly Thompson's was solid. Yeah, I started that one, and then I just didn't stick with it. Hey, 62 Lefty Blues is in the house. What is up? Uh, 
Dynamite, how you doing? <laughs> Eric says, Doc Ock ain't winning best hair at the CBCAs with that bowl cut. No, he's not. And, you know, it's hard to compete, you know. But, you know, I, I did I did make a, a, a vague promise during the bask and the glow of the week, like the victory run, the victory lap, you know, after we won all the CBC awards last year, we won five, right? And we were doing our victory laps and I went in and I said, you know what? I didn't know that the hair thing was going to bother people so much. So if I am nominated for best hair this year, I will decline. But we found a loophole. Now with my new top-down comic reviews, I'm going for best hands. I'm going for best hands, y'all. So let's do it. <laughs> let's get some people bitching about that. <laughs> y'all better watch out for me tonight. I'm on that bourbon. Woodford Reserve. One of the last times. I, I stopped drinking bourbon on streams because I wound up just kind of just kind of going a little too loose sometimes. <laughs> All right, I want to start a new thing here. And the new thing I want to start is answering some comments from recent videos. So I'm going to open up my YouTube studio on my phone, and I am going to read some comments and respond to them, because I'm really bad at responding to comments. I just typically don't do it, right? So I figured this would be a nice thing to do once I'm caught up with the chat here, which I am. So if y'all want to talk about something, let's go. Here we go. X-Men 97, what do y'all think? Let's get a conversation going while I do this. All right. This is a... So y'all know I've been putting out clips from previous Rock and Robbie Lives, Marvel in the 90s, Marvel in the 60s, stuff like that. I've been putting those out. And, uh, oh, I forgot to set the ones up for this week. Shit. Bear with me. I got to make a note. Set up. Bum, bum, bum. All right, so this is on the Spider-Man 1, first appearance of Spider-Man, Marvel in the 60s. Great stuff. Do some Alan Moore. Okay, let's do some Alan Moore. That's a great idea. All right, this is on the weekly pop culture wrap-up. Really looking forward to the X-Men titles, at least two of them. Never read any X-Men as of yet. All right. I would suggest, I mean, a lot of people would say go to the Claremont stuff. I would say the Grant Morrison stuff. That's what I really like, but... Yeah, this is a good place to start, too. Beetlejuice, for sure, got me excited. As always, appreciate the coverage, Robbie Sean. Well, thank you so much. I really do appreciate the comment. Glad you're looking forward to Beetlejuice. The information on all things coming soon is awesome. Thank you. Comment for algorithm. Thank you. We always get that one from you, so thank you so much. This is an interesting one. Big fan. Your brain should be studied by science with all the info you retain. Vader would say, impressive, most impressive. And I vote yes for Superman Top Down. I was talking about the possibility of going through the Superman Triangle era top down. What do y'all think? What is X-Force? See, I don't know if this is a troll or if it's someone le legitimately going, what's X-Force? X-Force is basically, the original concept seemed to be young, newer mutants taking the fight into their own hands and being more proactive with their solution to maintain peace between humans and mutants. Flip through the triangle era, brother. I'm here for some new Gerard Way. Simone is not a fan favorite. Gail Simone. I described Gail Simone as a fan favorite writer. I think that's an accurate statement. I think Gail Simone's got a following. I think that she will bring people to that book. I'm not part of that following. I think Gail Simone's a solid writer, but nothing super stands out to me about her work. I hope that she does a great job. I hope that the book is exciting. But I don't think it's wrong to call her a fan favorite writer. Figured NYX would be X-23 related. That's what I thought too, but then I started thinking this may just be like New York X-Men and the rumors or that it's very much Kamala Khan-centric, and that Iman Vellani is coming back to write. But just rumors. 
Been waiting on your thoughts on X-Men. Well, you got them. X-Men is questionable for the relaunching. Interesting. That Conan novel cover by Jeffrey Allen Love is so good. I agree. I'm probably going to read that Conan book. You've never seen the Evil Dead remake? You're not missing too much. I'd say you should sooner check out the Don't Breathe movies. I've heard good things about that Evil Dead movie, but I haven't seen that, nor have I seen Don't Breathe. So Station Robbie really enjoyed the previous episode. Would really like to see the Superman books. Precious Metal was the best news for me this week. Little Bird was fantastic. Me too, and I cannot wait to see Darcy and Ian come back to do another book in that world. Thank you for all your good info on new stories coming out. Great job. Well, thank you so much. On the weekly comic book review, somebody said, No Frogger? For shame, Robbie. No, I like Frogger too. Now, Pitfall and Cork are like two of my, not Quark, Cubert. What did I say? Fucking Quark. Uh, Cubert and, 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 uh, I was mentioned Cubert on the video, and I know that I mentioned, um, Missile Command and Pitfall, I think, as being like my favorite Atari games. So, I like Frogger too. I, I prefer the arcade, but I do like Frogger, and I, I have it on my Atari 2600, so. All right, on the uh, Frank Miller and Chris Claremont take Wolverine to Japan, Marvel in the 80s, Wolverine 1 through 4 by Claremont and Miller. Haven't read this story, but one day I hope to. I know it's a longer story, and I was wondering how they would make it for TV if it was filmed. A series of short films that are created to make it feel like an epic sounds like the best format for a long story with many ups and downs. I think having the Japanese film industry would make it be a must, because every Japanese live-action film I've ever seen has been, has been damn near flawless and cinematically has captured its intended purpose. Maybe they only send their best films over here, but if that's the case, the right creative team is put together. I think they will make a classic. Now, they did, didn't they, with the Wolverine, the, the, the second solo Wolverine film, the follow-up, I guess, to X-Men Origins Wolverine, if you want to call it that, um, didn't the Wolverine kind of try to take some elements from that? I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that movie. And then somebody on my Dynamite show from Friday said, Heck yeah, great episode, man. Keep rocking, baby. Well, thank you, Brad. I appreciate that. All right. That was fun. That was fun. All right. Best hands. You know it. You know it. Robbie responding to comments should be interesting. Well, those were all nice for the most part. So, I mean, we can go, we can, we can dive deeper maybe in the next segment. Dynamite says, I don't have a Disney Plus subscription, so not checking out X-Men. All right. Nine Panel Grid says, X-Men 97 had a smile on my face from start to finish. Perfection is rare, but they may have achieved it. What the fuck you smoking, brother? Perfection? Perfection. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. I get liking it. Perfection? Okay. Okay. Both says, 97 is chill. Not in love, but I was entertained. Dwayne Payne says, I felt X-Men 97 should have been more. Should have been more. They played it safe, plus the animation was not as good as it was, in my opinion. Eddie says, what is X-Force, though? It's the force of X. Chill Out Man says, they killed Morph. Yeah, so we got Mystique. Sorry, Morph. No, it's still Morph. But all Morph seems to be there for is so that they can cameo other X-Men characters. I guess. And you're right. He's kind of like, he's more like Mystique. I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Well, they have to, they have to dive deeper into Morph for me. But it's, right now, it seems like Morph's whole purpose to being there is just so that they can not have to write Colossus in an episode, but have Colossus appear. Or Psylocke or Sabretooth or some shit like that. Okay. That's fine. Both says, that X-Force question was me. <laughs> Not a troll, just new and lazy. Okay. No, th so X-Force, um, New Mutants was a book about the younger uh, class of mutants coming up. It was like ran through the 80s. Bill Sienkiewicz kind of like had a big run on there and stuff like that. Um, and then... Um, eventually Rob Liefeld came in, introduced Cable and, and kind of made it a little bit more edgy, a little bit more into the nineties. And they were trying to take a more proactive approach to dealing with the uh, situation of being hated and feared by a, uh, a world they're trying to protect. 
And uh, so that's that's what I would say it's about. But a lot of people, a lot of the modern explanation has been more of a Black Ops, Wetworks, X-Men team. But the original concept is more about a proactive younger force. I think that's on. That's I think that's what it is on a metaphorical level. Would you recommend reading Star Wars comics? The new trailer has me very excited. And I'm a big lore person. I mean, sure, go for it. I don't read some of them. I'll tell you what, though. There are some that I've like. I've read the uh, Star Wars Legacy. It's probably been one of my favorite Star Wars books I've ever read. It, like, takes place in a probable future, I guess. Uh, Luke's Kids. And uh, I like that one a lot. Um, Knights of the Old Republic's decent. I, the, the old Dark Horse stuff. Uh, back with Dark Horse had a really good run for a while there. Uh, they they had, like, their Star Wars Empire book. I, I like that. Tales from the Jedi. Um, but I, I'm not the guy to ask about Star Wars books. I haven't read too many of them. So anybody can help Anissa out. What are some good Star Wars books to read? Well, Jay, I know that you would love to see me cover Superman. Thoughts on Roadhouse? I liked it. My thoughts, I haven't seen it yet. My thoughts will be revealed Friday afternoon on our show with Rex and Amy. I do have the Uncanny X-Force Omni on my list. Hope it's good. Uncanny X-Force by Rick Remender is really good. That's a really good run. I like that book a lot. Hey, Joe Corallo's in the house. X-Men 97 was pretty good for what it is. All right. Chill Out Man says, I'm not watching X-Men until the season ends. Same here, says Jay, which is hard given my job. Preston says, Morph is there to hand Logan a beer. You're right. <laughs> There's that too. I like that they actually were like playing on the friendship because in the first episodes of the original series, Night of the Sentinels, when Morph dies and the follow-up to that, like Wolverine is really taking it hard. Like really taking it hard. So they better be fucking friends. He better bring his ass a beer and then turn to Sabretooth so they can wrestle. Okay. Some weird biz. Here's my thoughts. To me, my X-Men, good evening, Robbie, and all there. What's up, Hamburger? How are you doing? So, I thought the X-Men 97 was okay. I thought it was fine. Was nothing about it pissed me off. Nothing about it upset me. I enjoyed it for the most part. And honestly, I, I love that X-Men show from back in the day. Y'all know that. We went through the first season here on Rockin' Robbie Live with the, sh the little segment we called an, X -Men, uh, an, an annotation on X-Men animation or something like that. Um... So I love that series, and that's not a perfect, flawless series either, right? So, of course, we're coming back to it. Does it work? I, I think it works. I think it's fine. It does put me back into that world where, like, the mutants, like, were in a dire situation, and it was, like, dangerous to be a mutant, right? And that whole vibe and that they really captured very well in that original pilot, Night of the Sentinels, which I think is still just top-notch, top-notch stuff. Um, I had no problem with the story, right? It picks up at the end of the series. The The idea of where they're at, you know, Gene's having the baby, Cable. That ain't Gene, probably. We had that cliffhanger ending. She's probably the Goblin Queen. That's cool. You know, playing with that lore, playing with stuff that they didn't do, but still very much 90s. That's cool. Um, I, I liked all that. I, I, I liked the Magneto stuff, stuff too, and that, that fight at the UN I thought was pretty dope. The animation. I would say that the animation is better now than it was then. But maybe that's some kind of weird uncanny valley for me, right? Because there's something about the animation that's almost like too crisp and too 3D. Now, it does still feel retro but at the same time, it feels like a fake retro, right? And I'm not, like, knocking it for that or anything, but there are some weird choices in this damn thing, too. Um, there are some weird story choices. I don't necessarily like what happened to Storm at the end of issue two, but looking at the episode names list, we have Life Death Part 1 and Life Death Part 2 coming, so I think that they're going to do some interesting things with Storm this season. Storm was the best for me. And that's kind of like when you watch the first season of X-Men and like, I love beast. He's like my favorite X-Men, um, X-Men character, beast, uh, nightcrawler and Wolvie. But like, 
I hated how Beast was like in prison that whole first season. I feel like taking Storm off the board so early on is just kind of disappointing because she is the best and most powerful, and that presence is still there. Beast still works for me, but very underutilized. Gambit I like. I like the shit going on with him and Rogue, and they're starting that love triangle, that creepy love triangle between Magneto and Rogue and, and, and Gambit. And I saw a lot of people bitching about Gambit's like crop top tee or whatever, but that's totally some shit Gambit would have worn in the 90s. Like, why y'all acting crazy, right? Now, there are some returning voices. Storm, perfect. Beast, perfect. I thought that was the, the original Cyclops coming back. It's not. It's another dude. His Cyclops sounds exactly like the Cyclops from the original. And I love the whole not, the I surrender not bit, which is a reference to Night of the Sentinels. So that's cool. Um, then there's Rogue and Wolverine. Now I appreciate having the original voice actors back. But Rogue at Wolverine, they sound off. And these people are older, and I understand why, but it just doesn't quite click for me. But the thing that's more annoying, and the thing that's the most annoying thing to me about the show, once again, it all goes back to Night of the Sentinels. I feel like they're just playing the hits, right? So in Night of the Sentinels, Rogue says... Y'all are more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. Well, that's just like a nice little fun statement that probably a southern belle would say, right? But apparently this writer has determined that means that Rogue is really into cat sayings. And there's an episode where there's literally three or four fucking cat analogies and... It was so fucking annoying to me. It was so annoying to me. Um, but all in all, I thought it was fine. I thought the executioner looked cool. That was neat. But I want to see more. I want to see more. I want to see where it goes. I want to see where it develops. But I'll tell you what. When I first put it on, you hear the uh, new version of the theme. It's not all quite there. And I wish it was fuller. But it, I, at the same time, it kind of is more full than the original. But I wish it had a little bit more oomph to it. But... Hey man, that shit's dope when you hear the dun, 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 boom, ba dun, ba dun. So overall, I liked it. I thought it was good. I don't think it's the greatest thing ever. And this is the thing I'm seeing. A lot of people say, this is fucking perfect. This is great. This is awesome. Like, like E, like E. Very valid opinion. I don't think so. But, okay. I think it's all right. I think it's all right. I think it's all right. Oh, Deo, I love cats. I just hate cat. I just hate that. That's that shit with Rogue is stupid. Come on, y'all. You got to admit that. You got to admit that, right? Let's take a look at the chat. All right, Derek says, after recently binging the entire original series, 97 is an improvement in every way. Boat says, are there any licensed properties you'd like to see new series of in comics? How about Kelly Thompson coming back to do more Jim and the Holograms? That's what I want. How about Buckaroo Banza? I'd like to see Buckaroo Banza. Ed says, I remember pulling Star Wars Legacy and enjoying it. I feel the comics were better before the Disney buyout, sadly. Chill Out Man says, I only like Star Wars when it's about a Sith. Jay says, I wish Alex was here to answer the Star Wars for Anissa. Bell Dub One says, don't like Star Wars comics in general, but liked the art in that Visions book you recommended last week. Yeah, the art was really good in that. Joe says, what is it with the past few years or so where, to me, my X-Men has been used so much? Like... I don't know where the reverence for that line came from. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Grant Morrison, maybe? <laughs> Eddie says, haven't watched the X-Men show since I was a kid, so I don't know if I should watch it from the beginning or not. Yeah, do it. Do you recommend watching the original before the new show? I mean, yeah, I guess you don't have to, but it's definitely made... For people. Oh, that's the other thing. I don't like Jubilee's thing. Some stuff in the animation is fucking off to me and wonky, right? For instance, the dance scene between Rambertto 
and or Roberto and uh and and Jubilee is so weird. Just weird. It's just weird. There's something about it just weird to me. I don't know. I'm watching this and I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was all right. <laughs> hey, what's up, reselling with Woody? Good to see you here. Stu says Storm jumping at the thunderclap after she had been deep powered was a highlight for me. Okay, deep powered. Okay, God. do what's who's deep powered? What the fuck's he got to do with anything? Chill out, man. Says OG episode two, I believe, has a nice shot of Rogues, but. But you're not going to find that in the new season. Yeah, I've seen all the memes about Rogue's butt. Who cares? <laughs> that joke's old, man. Come on, chill out, man. That joke's old. And, you, and it's not even yours. Come on, man. Let's do better. <laughs> yes, Robbie does love cats. Even cougars. <laughs> all right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back... DC sneak peek. And maybe we'll be talking about Ghostbusters. We'll be right back here on Rockin' Robbie Alive. I so hope this part doesn't go in the video where I'm just standing here, staring forwards. That'd be so embarrassing.
everybody. Welcome back here to Pop Culture Philosophers. This is Rockin' Robbie Live. I am your host, Rockin' Robbie Bills, and tonight we have been talking about comic books, movies, pop culture, and a whole lot more. We had a little bit of a discussion on X-Men 97. Seems like most of the chat really liked it. I thought it was all right, but we shall see what happens as the series progresses. We chatted a little bit about just all kinds of random stuff. Coming up, we got the DC sneak peek, and we got the Ghostbusters Frozen Empire spoiler-free-ish I don't know, like, if you don't know anything about the movie, I'm going to spoil some stuff about the movie, but nothing that wasn't in a trailer, right? So anyway, I'll be talking about Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, a little bit of show and tell later on, and maybe even a sneak peek at the latest top-down comic book review um, that's going to be dropping in a couple of weeks. But if you want an early look at it, let's see some support. With a super chat. That's right. Super chats are welcome. They will trigger a Joker video. You can also support the channel over at patreon.com slash PCP, like these fine PCP patrons right there. Coming soon to Patreon in April will be um, movie watch-alongs with me at least once a month. We'll gather and watch a movie right there on that screen. I got a cord that I need for it. It's on the Amazon PCP Studio upgrade list, which is pinned at the top. If you feel so inclined, you can support that way. But all the support we need is you being here, participating in the conversation, liking, sharing, subscribing. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. If you're on Facebook, join the PCP Army. That's the official Pop Culture Philosophers Facebook group. You can also follow me on X at the Rockin' Robbie, and you can check out popculturephilosophers.com for podcast blogs, and a whole lot more. Coming up this week, tomorrow night, we've got Spiral. That's right, Spiral for March Madness, the PCP finale of March Madness, 2007's Adam Green co-directed film, Spiral. Manny this week is going to be talking about superheroes and demons colliding, taking a look at Ghost Rider, the Spectre, and we have demons. Manny's been pumping out some really great content for March Madness, including a live stream today where him and Tiff ranked the Exorcist franchise. Then over at Blood Splatter Chatter, his finale for March Madness is going to be Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central Time. I will be on that show. It's Black Swan. Very excited to chat about that movie. And the grand finale over at Dylan's Horror Show, I'll be there Saturday night, at some point in the evening, to talk about possession here on March Madness. We now pause for station identification. Get your stations out, y'all. And we got to thank Boat for the super chat. Pop, pop, boom, everybody. Hey, Boat, I'm going to give you a special bonus. We're going to do this Hellboy song, and then we're going to do some God smack. That's what we're going to do. Station! I really do appreciate it, Boat. Thank you for the support. Let me tell you about this little man I know. His name is Hellboy. He was sent to the earth some long time ago to save it or destroy. Brought to this earth by a Rasputin, son of a demon and a nun who had a sex with the demon. But was raised by Professor Broom.
I wonder day to day. I don't like you anyway. And I don't need your shit today. You're pathetic in your own way. I feel for you. Better fucking go away. I will behave. You better go away. I'm doing the best that I ever did. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm doing the best I ever did. I don't need to fantasize. You're on my pet all the time. And I don't mind if you go blind. You get what you get until you're through with mine. I feel for you. I better fucking go away. I will behave. You better go away. I feel for you. You better fucking go away. I will behave. You better go away. I'm doing the best I ever did. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm doing the best I ever did. Now go away. I'm doing the best I ever did. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm doing the best I ever did. Now go away. Dan, 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 go away. Dan, 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 Dan. All right, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. <laughs> that was, for some reason, just Spotify decided to put fucking Godsmack back in my life today, and and I'm here for it. So, Boat, thank you so much. This this bourbon's for you. All right, y'all. The secret goal for the sneak peek tonight is $20, so we are halfway there. By the way, I think this is telling me that was your fifth Super Chat boat, so thank you so much five times. Station! 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 Hell yeah. Lost count. Reselling with Woody says, I'm doing a reselling channel now. Everybody go sub up if you want. Throw out your link, somebody, please. Sledhead is in the house. What is up, man? Good to see you here. Wait, did Robbie get de-aged like in the last Indiana Jones movie? I should put my voice on Lil Davey. <laughs> Sledhead says, gently caress that like button. I would appreciate that. Just Nobody needs to fuck up their keyboard or nothing. Spectre is spelled wrong, I know. I'm using an old... Manny knows too. I'm using an old thumbnail that I should not have. Also, Thursday night, the best of the com uh, best of the comics month. Best of the comics month stream on YouTube. <laughs> the best comics of the month stream, the monthly comic book review. Thursday night, 6 p.m. Central Time. Robbie is aging like a fine wine. Well, thank you so much. I'll be 43 next month. <clears throat> like a month and like a couple weeks. Yeah, a month and a half. That's what 43. I'm okay with it. I'm okay. I'm okay. I still feel young. I still feel relevant. I still feel hip. <laughs> fucking up here on YouTube singing God Smack for some fucking reason. <laughs> Jabe says, popping in and out, nothing like getting some work done and listening to the multi award winning Rock and Robbie. Well, thank you so much, brother. Rocking, yeah, you, you, Preston says, Woody, you should hear his rendition of Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, we did that a couple weeks ago. We've done that before. That's a fun one. Next Super Chat, you get a request. It's even better if it's a Godsmack song. <laughs> Rogue Collecting says, finally read Little Bird today. Can't wait for Precious Metal in June. I am so fucking ready for Precious Metal. I've been ready for years. That book came out, I think it was 2019. That was my best book of the year, the year it came out. Whether it was 2018 or 2019, I don't remember. But love that book. Love, love, love it. This is how we get more Super Chats on Comic Collectibles. Well, Jay, tr the problem is Rex and John, they just don't understand. They just don't get it. 
Tom says, that Hellboy song is fire, 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 fire. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, Lord. I remember when we retired it, because I was like, you know, everybody's got to be tired of the Hellboy song. So we retired it. Nobody was tired of it, actually. They, they wanted it back, and so now it's back. Maybe I should retire it again just to get people to appreciate it again. Dwayne's a pain says, I want to sing like that when I'm at work. I do all the time. So one of the benefits of working at a place like a comic shop is you can be as silly as you want most of the fucking time. Is that Sully Erna over there? I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what that means. Chill out, man says, Robbie. Please stop saying your age. I hate that you're younger and more awesome than me. Ah, oh, no. No, no, no. Chill out, man. Don't say shit like that. It all starts with the story you tell yourself. So you better start telling yourself a better fucking story, chill out, man. You are the shit. Here's the chill out, man, everybody. Sully is the ginger, is the singer of God. Ah, oh, okay. Just go away. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm feeling the bourbon. What's going to happen here? And this is, says, coming from a 20-year-old, you're very hip, Robbie. Well, thank you. <laughs> Jay says, Robbie got that riz, as the kids say. That's what Jelani says, too. Jelani thinks he's a kid. Jelani's older than me. <laughs> All right, y'all. Believe it or not, DC's got books out this week. I've read them, and now it's time for your very own official <laughs> DC sneak peek. All right, we're going to kick it off with Flash issue number seven. I was just talking with the Brainiac this week about the Flash. And he was like, I feel lost. I feel like I'm just going to wait till the run. Sidesbury is doing like 12 issues. I'm going to wait, maybe read it all together. I was like, I feel you, brother, 100%. Because as much as I have been loving these mind-boggling quantum mechanical concepts and these high-concept sci-fi ideas in the pages of the Flash... It's been a bit confusing. But every issue, it pulls me right back in. Every issue. I can't really explain to you the nuanced details about what's going on. But there is a lot of cool, high-concept sci-fi stuff happening in the pages of The Flash. And Cy Spurrier knows this. He's, he's got to know this is a challenging book. So this issue, which does not have Mike Diodato on it, it's got a different artist. And by the way, double page, you know, credit things like this. I like these. This was definitely something that's been done before and in modern times really kind of led by Jonathan Hickman and his work. But like when these work, they work. And in this issue of The Flash, it works. It is Ramon Perez on the art here. But now you got Barry involved. You got Max Mercury and Bart in this issue. You have a deepening on what's going on and more of a full explanation of what's going on and even more new, cool, gnarly, high concept sci-fi ideas. I'm loving the flash. I'm loving the flash. There are issues where I just straight up am so confused, but it doesn't matter. This is the kind of stuff I want out of flash. This is why I lament that we didn't get that Grant Morrison five, seven year epic on the flash that they wanted to do. But this is as close as we're going to get. Then we got penguin here with issue number eight. Y'all, I really love Tom King's Penguin book. I really, really do. The last couple of issues had some revelations about Penguin, Penguin's history, Penguin's place in Gotham, and how that is connected to Batman. And I told y'all, as much as I'm liking the series, which is a very mean-spirited book that I'm surprised Tom... Tom told me, he's like, I'm surprised they're letting me get away with some of this. And I agree, as far as a mainstream... DC book that the fact that this isn't a vertigo book and I know exactly what he means now because there's revelations about I, I'm going to I'm just going to say this Penguin and Batman have had like a truce and an agreement throughout the entirety of the Penguin's history in Gotham and now the Penguin is having been presumed dead and now his kids are running things in his stead he has now been making the steps in the first like five issues to 
retake Gotham. And the last two issues recontextualize the whole relationship between Penguin, Oswald, and Batman Bruce. And I didn't know how I felt about it until I read this issue. And man, I love this book so much. This book's so good. So now Penguin is back in Gotham. All the shit has been set up. Now the moves are being made. Y'all, if you're not reading this, and I know for a fact that a lot of y'all aren't, because sales are very weak on this, this is a hellaciously awesome, mean-spirited book by Tom King. An amazing art. Raphael De La Torre is back on this issue, so heck yeah. Alan Scott, Green Lantern, issue number five. This is a clunky issue of a pretty solid series. We've really been liking this on the monthly comic book review. We've been singing its praises. This one, they they can't just let the villain be the villain, so they have to kind of like do some clunky things in the storytelling to set up the finale of the series. This is the penultimate issue, but I did like the ending. I just feel like this book has explored so much tragedy to Alan that this almost feels like a really clunky way to kind of power through that towards the finale. But I still liked it. I still thought it was decent. Then we've got Green Arrow issue number 10. Ollie is on a mission um, from Amanda Waller, and the only reason why he's doing it is because he doesn't trust her. He knows that she's pulling the strings. He can see everything else going awry in the DC Universe that seems like other, other heroes can't. Plus, he needs to find Roy. Because last he saw, Roy was dead. Last Roy saw, Ollie's dead. So they're trying to find each other, but last Roy was seen was going on a mission for Amanda Waller to try to recover the supposedly deleted confessionals from Sanctuary. That's right, we're referencing Heroes in Crisis but you know what? Josh Williamson knows what he's doing. Even some of the bits of DC history that we may not like, they still exist, they're still there, and they still can be elaborated on and played with. And Josh Williamson knows how to do that. The way he's building legacy in the pages of Green Arrow um, from the start has been absolutely astounding. And here in issue number 10, bringing back long-lost characters that I almost forgot about. So Josh Williamson's doing a great job on Green Arrow. That book's been solid. Then we've got Detective Comics 1083. This is the big sweeping moment in the opera where the hero confronts his ultimate demons and has to overcome them. You have a very real and, and inspiring Batman dealing with the interior world and, and who he is. And now we've seen this done. But we've never seen it done this way in this sweeping, romantically tragic and operatic sense. Absolutely amazing. The way the story is structured, too, with this question story and how the question relates to the truth, but not quite justice. Rom V knows how to turn a phrase. Rom V knows how to structure a story. Even something that seems like very familiar. And honestly, if I just describe the plot to you of Rom V's detective run, you'd be like, been there, done that. But nobody's done it like this. My only nitpick with this is Ricardo Federici's artwork. The coloring is really weak. And I don't know if it's necessarily the coloring or the way that it's printing, but moments that should be really cool. They may, be, they may actually look cooler on the screen, but in person, they are a bit muddy. And when you look at the other bits right next to it, you can see the difference, right? So it's just like, it's not... The color's not quite working on there, and I don't know if that's necessarily the choice is being made by Ricardo or whoever's coloring it. Is Ricardo coloring it? Uh, it's either the colorist or it's just the printing. But then again, like in the backup story, like the colors are fine there. They, they pop, so it's the colorist just needs to pump up his levels. It's Lee Lowridge. He should know what he's doing. Lee Lowridge is an amazing colorist. He's doing amazing coloring on... Um, The one hand. I had to think about that for a moment. Maybe Ricardo's coloring himself. I'm not sure. All right. But the last one I want to talk about is Batman The Dark Age. Um, so Superman Space Age was Mark Russell and Mike Allred and Laura Allred doing a Silver Age set Superman book that kind of like leaned into the crisis kind of stuff. And I really loved the first issue and I liked it for the most part, but I felt like it lost itself a little bit. This is kind of the same thing, but with Batman, there is a connection and a tie-in to that world, but this is very Batman centric and is a very different origin for Batman than we're used to. Um, his parents still get killed, but for instance, he's not there, 
right? And he kind of acts like a stuck up, rich, spoiled kid throughout most of his life. He comes across Lena earlier. It's a really cool Elseworlds type tale for Batman. But the most impressive thing is, y'all, this is Mike Allred doing a Batman book. I'm a huge fan of Mike Allred. I've been a fan of his since the 90s when I first discovered Madman. Really great artwork. I'm here for anything that the Allreds do. Mike and Laura together are an unstoppable team. I really do like the vibe of this story. I like the different take on things. It felt familiar, but it's felt different at the same time. And it felt like it wasn't being different just for different sake. It's actually saying something about the time. And then towards the end, you get that tie-in that may remind you, oh, is this connected to Superman Space Age? Well, that's pretty dope. So let's recap. Flash, challenging, but always super cool. The Penguin, this this becoming one of my favorite books right now. Then we got Alan Scott Green Lantern, a little bit of a clunky issue, but it was decent. Green Arrow, the way Josh Williamson's working with Le uh, Legacy is awesome. Detective Comics, big and sweeping and romantic and tragic. And then Batman Dark Age, Mike Allred, Mark Russell, Laura Allred. What more can you ask for? Out of everything I read from DC this week, my favorite is Tom King's The Penguin, y'all. Absolutely. Top notch station. That's your DC sneak peek. All right, let's take a look at the chat. Hey, what's up, Mr. Rare Key? How you doing? <coughs> Getting choked up on my vape there. Zombie dance, what is up? Reselling with Woody says, I forgot how fun it is to hang out with my comic fam. Station, station and cheers, buddy. Nine Panel Grid says, it was time for another bourbon stream. Yeah, I should have brought bourbon to Black Swan. Should have. Should have, would have, could have, didn't. I was bearing it up. I pulled. Bo says, I've heard a lot of people drop hate on this Flash run. It's my first run and I'm loving it. Flash is the reason I got into comics. Hell yeah. What, what was it about Flash, Bo? Was it the character or was it like the show or something like that? Anissa says, Green Arrow cover looks dope. I don't know who the women are, but they look badass, so I have to pick it up. Speedy, Arrowette, and Red Arrow, or Red Canary, and Red Arrow. Yeah. I, uh, there's some good Green Arrow stuff out there, Anissa, I think you would like. The Kevin Smith run, the Brad Meltzer run, that was a follow-up to that, and then you can kind of just jump into, like, Jeff Lemire's New 52 run with Andre Sorrentino was great. Sledhead's looking forward to Detective Comics. We got Chocos in the house station, my man. What's up? Reselling says, that's a good book, and I agree with the coloring. Mr. Rarekey says, I haven't yet really gotten to Detective Comics. What would y'all say would be the luring difference between the two titles and worlds? Roms is less connected to the DC continuity. Chip is very much connected to DC continuity. Everything Chip's been doing and setting up in the pages of Batman has been helping lean in lead into absolute power of the upcoming DC event so that it feels earned, right? Um, Rom is doing a more perennial, more evergreen kind of thing that will always kind of stand on its own. That's not necessarily plugged into continuity, has some elements that seem plugged in, but it's kind of its own thing. And the basic gist is this. It is the structure of a classic opera with everything that in, that entails, meaning an overture or a prelude, right? And then, you know, the the act one, act two, an intermission, act three, all of that's in here. The structure is there, but also everything that entails an opera as far as that sweeping sense of romance. And when I don't when I mean romance, I don't mean like like love and shit. I mean like this gothic romantic balance of tragedy and heroism and anguish and despair, but hope and optimism, like just big sweeping feelings and absolutely supremely mythological, right? It's a mythologically driven Batman story that leans very heavy into stuff that was set up by Grant Morrison. So it's not dependent on that, but you will appreciate it more if you know more of that Pete Milligan, 
stuff that was set up with Barbados that then Grant Morrison ran with in their run. So that's the difference to me. And I think it's better because of it, but I think there needs to be a Batman book that's plugged into continuity. That's what Chip's doing. I think there needs to be Batman books that are just trying to tell the best Batman stories they can and get to the mythological core, tragic root of that character and pull the hope out of it. And this is the moment where hope rises. I mean, if you know classic structure not just for opera but for like greek tragedies and 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 other forms of of classic literature or or stage plays and shit like that it's it's all there we were talking about black swan last week we recorded it comes out this thursday um you know that the whole that whole thing so it's like it's big and it's so heavy with all of its emotions and it's not it's not overly subtle at all it's very direct and very in your face and and it's intended and designed to be that way Plus, there's a bunch of different artists on it, but the way that the art flows from one to another is kind of like the sweeping. The artists are like the musical notes and the instruments, right? And everything just kind of works together to make this big orchestral, sweeping, romantically tragic and gothic operatic tale. That's what I would say. All she says, I had to pee and caught myself singing your stupid Hellboy song. <laughs> Let me tell you about this little man I know. All right, we're halfway to our fundraising goal tonight. We need 10 more dollars in Super Chats, and then you will unlock a sneak peek, the full video of a top-down review of a Marvel comic from the 70s. It's a Marvel comic from 1974. So I'll give you that hint. $10 in Super Chats. We get that set up as well as helping out the channel and the support. And if you Super Chat, request a song, bonus points if it's Godsmack, and uh, and I'll sing it. <laughs> well, it's okay, Woody. You're here with us now. Yo! Chris from Lost in Comics Station. Chris is going to be joining us on our show Thursday night of the monthly comic book review, 6 p.m. Central Time. Both saying on uh, what got him into Flash, got, or what about Flash got him into comics, probably just the super speed aspect as his powers. I'd only seen his depictions in passing, so I didn't know much about Wally or Barry yet. Hell yeah. I'm talking about Green Arrow. Jay says, Longbow Hunters is epic. That's a really good one. Mike Rell, fantastic stuff. Chill Out Man says, Changes, John. Station, if I have missed you, Robbie is big time now. Commercials keep interrupting my show. Sorry about that. YouTube picks the commercials. I gave them the... I gave it to them. I can put one on, though. Do you want, you want, a, you want an ad? Just kidding. Oh, you're always welcome for the recommendations in this, so they come free. Woody says, Robbie, your channel's really improved, brother. Love it. Well, thank you so much. We're multi-award winning now, so we got to step it up, you know. And the way we step it up, a little bit of bourbon. So there you go. <laughs> Hawkeye by Matt Fraction was another big part of it. Yeah, the Hawkeye book by Matt Fraction's perennial. Should always be in print. All right, Eric from Nine Panel Grid, he's got a good one for you. Batman is gigantic moronic splendor. Detective is enormous poetic grandeur. Yes. I like that. I'm going to steal that, E. Rare Key says, nice, bet. Thanks for that answer. I got to say... Damn, I'm sold. I'm going to start picking up Detective Comics. Rom V's run, I believe it starts 1063. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's almost over. It's only got... It ends at 1089. This is 1083. So we only got six, is six issues left? Shit. Or is it 86 where it ends? I don't remember. But Alex Pacnadel's coming in right after that, so that's cool. Woody says, be patient with his YouTube channel. He'll start gearing it more towards comics eventually. 
<laughs> you want some of this? Just swing, swing on by. Come on, man. It's good shit. I'm starting to feel pretty loose. All right. <laughs> Has anybody out there seen Ghostbusters Frozen Empire? Well, there's been a lot of negativity about about it out there. Like, I kept away from the reviews, but even though I don't re read reviews, I can see and feel the shit coming, right? Like, I could just see from comments, I could see from posts, I could see from headlines and shit. Bah. Excuse me. <clears throat> the movie's been being bashed by a lot of people, and here's what's crazy. I'm not part of any Ghostbusters clubs or groups on Facebook, but I kept having all these, um, like, like Ghostbuster groups, like suggested things, like suggested posts pop up in my feed. And it was all like people arguing and it was all people being like, yo, I'm sorry to say this new Ghostbusters movie blows. And, and then other people being like, yo, you don't have to fucking just, just cause you didn't like the movie doesn't mean you got to shit on it. Like that whole fucking thing. That's how it is with any fandom. That's how it is with any fandom. Right? You're going to have people that are going to hate it. You're going to have people that are going to love it. And those people ain't going to get along. But here on Pop Culture Philosophers, you can be assured that you're going to get honest, no fluff, no bullshit reviews. And if the review is going to be biased, I'll let you know. Y'all, it's Horror Fest. It's March Madness. At a point five, you dig to everything. <laughs> because we tell you why we liked the movie or why we didn't. So... With that being said, let's talk about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire in a non-spoiler way. Alright, this afternoon I uh, smoked a bowl and I went to the movies and I saw Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I hadn't been in the movies in a minute. I did go see Dune 2 a few weeks ago and I had a lot of fun with that, but... Since then, like, Wonka and on Christmas was, like, my last one. So I'm trying to get back into my, like, weekly ritual and routine of going to my temple on Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. That's the movie theater to watch a movie. And today, I chose Ghostbusters Frozen Empire because I thought it would be topical. But at the same time, there was another film I wanted to see. It's called Immaculate. I'm hearing good things about that. There's a there's another horror film I can't remember the name of it right now but it was only playing it was playing too late for me to be able to watch that and and do the stream. So I decided to watch this one. And to be honest, I was not looking forward to it, y'all. I did not really enjoy Ghostbusters Afterlife. I thought it had elements that worked, but for the most part it didn't work for me. But I'm going to tell you this, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, it kind of worked for me. Not everything was perfect, and I got a lot of nitpicks about it, but overall I kind of enjoyed it. First of all, I enjoyed the nostalgia of having Ghostbusters back in the firehouse, focused on that. I love seeing the Ecto-1 like in action from the get-go of the movie. A really nice scene of them chasing a ghost through the streets of New York trying to capture it. I love seeing the returning old-school members of the cast. Bill Murray, Annie Potts, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson... I loved the fact that they had more of a role in this movie, except for Vankman. Um, but Dan Aykroyd and Ernie Hudson, they had more to do in this one. Now, what's her name? Let me look this up. Is it, is, I wanted to say Terrence McKenna, but I know that's not right. Is it McKenna something? Um, what's her name? McKenna Grace. McKenna Grace's Phoebe is kind of like the main character this go round, and I do think that she is a standout from the previous film, some of the things I liked about Afterlife mostly involved her and podcast and, and Paul Rudd, like going around doing their thing, right? Um, so she was fine. She was the focus. But because of that, some of the other characters just kind of get put to the back burner. Like her mother, she's got a nice little arc with her. Paul Rudd's got a nice little arc. But for the most part, this is Phoebe's movie. But even that doesn't feel like it is when you watch the movie because... It's kind of stuffed with characters, right? Now, there's podcasts right there, and I didn't mind them in the afterlife, but I really didn't mind them in this one. Like, he was actually a fine, fun addition. I thought it was fine, but everybody else, like all the other core Ghostbusters from the previous film, 
they kind of get just like left in the dust, right? The mom, Paul Rudd's character, and Finn Wolfgard's character, right? They really don't have too much to do in this movie because not only is it really trying to veer in a Phoebe thing and setting up an interesting plot, but they also have the old school guys coming in, right? Now, there are a lot of scenes that were in a trailer or in shots or like photos that got leaked that are not in the movie. In fact, part of the thing I've seen in these Ghostbuster groups is all these people that spend a lot of money on those red jackets that are really pissed off they're not really in the movie. They're like two characters wear them and it's not even the main characters. Like it's it's so weird, the marketing on this movie. All we wanted was Ecto Cooler, y'all. That's all we wanted. And you couldn't deliver it. Now, there are some new characters. Like, there's this whole new operation for Ghostbusters now that it's run by somebody with money, right? Ernie Hudson. Dan Aykroyd is 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 very much involved. But, like, that new character, the blonde dude with the glasses, he's like this British guy. I really liked him. I would have liked to have seen more of him. He had this nice, like, dry wit that almost felt... I'm not saying he was an Egon replacement, but it felt like if anybody was going to be an Egon replacement, maybe it'd be him. Plus, the chick from the previous movies in there... Some of these people like Podcast and Heard, they're in the movie, but you don't really know why they're necessarily there. Like, they don't have to be, you know? Like, it just doesn't need to be. But at the same time, it works sometimes for me. That's Lucky. Yeah, that's right. Lucky in the movie. I think she's Ernie Hudson's daughter or granddaughter in the movie or something, right? The overall plot of the movie is is pretty fun, and the characters work well together. And it's got this nice, like, family kind of vibe, and it does center a lot around that firehouse and that family unit. And then you've got, what's this dude's name? Uh, Nanjani, right? It's like Kamal Nanjani. Like, I know him as the best part and the only part I liked of the Eternals movie. I've seen him in other things. He's hilarious. He's really good in this. They do this kind of, like, nostalgic shit, though, where... They're like, he's the fire master, right? So the, the key master, the gate, what all that. It's just more of that kind of shit. He didn't need to be there because, once again, I loved him in the movie, but there's so much. This movie is overstuffed, right? Now, you do have returning characters, the old school guys. Ernie gets a little bit more to do. Bill Murray's barely in there. Annie Potts makes a cute couple little things here and there. Dan Aykroyd, though, is definitely more involved in the story. And I think his involvement really enriched this movie. Uh, Ray and Phoebe together, that feels to me like the new heart of the Ghostbusters. I was disappointed that there's not a lot of Paul Rudd in this film. But like I said, there's just... It's a tightly paced movie that doesn't really waste a lot of time. And at times, it, there there's moments where it does feel slow. There is this like weird love story with a main character and a ghost that doesn't quite work for me. Like, it doesn't mean it's fine, but it just doesn't quite fully work because I feel like it distracts from everybody else. But that is what kind of makes this Phoebe's movie, I guess. The villain, this big, like, ancient, like, pre-Sumerian god who wants to freeze the world with fright or something. Very cool design, very creepy factor. We got Slimer returning, the actual Slimer. In fact, the whole reason why Femme Wolfgard's in this movie, apparently, is... Slimer. Like, it's literally the only bit he has. That and wanting to drive the car. Um, but it works. Like, I, I liked seeing Slimer. That was fun. But overall, just a bit too overstuffed. There are a bunch of characters in this movie. And because of that, certain characters feel like they're meaningless. Like, they're not there. Like, they're, it feels like... Like, Jer for Jeremy John said this. It feels like some of these characters are only there because they were in the last movie. Right, But there's no like story reason for them to be there or character-driven reason to be there. Now, I'm not saying that we're watching Ghostbuster movies to, for characterization, but I don't know, man. In those first two Ghostbuster movies, like there's some decent characterization in there. So overall, I would say this was a good, fun movie. I enjoyed watching it. I, I really did. I did not ever get bored. Um, I had to leave one time to go take a whiz. I came right back. And I left right at the end of a big exposition scene and I came back and, I mean, when I'm at the movies, I'm like, boom, boom, boom. I'm like in and out. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know how to do it. I know how to do it right. Um, but I enjoyed the film. It was never boring. It had a nice pace to it. There were a couple moments where it felt like it slowed up, mostly in the ghost love story, right? There's a lot of like build up to the villain too, where, where like when the villain gets unleashed, it becomes badass, but then it gets done. That should have been done earlier right? There's more build up to it than resolution to it. And I feel like it's a little bit 
maybe that's an imbalance in the film. I feel like the big release should have happened a little bit earlier in the film. We could have dealt more of this. Um, but you just didn't have a lot of time to deal with these characters. Now, there's rumors that there's a lot on the cutting room floor. Maybe like 15, 20 minutes. Maybe there'll be an extended cut. We'll see. Will that fuck up the pacing, though? I'm not sure. But as it is, it's nicely paced. But the biggest problem with the movie is that there are too many... It's it's overstuffed. There's too much in there where everything is just a little bit... If this was just an episode of a TV show, then it would be fine. But it's not. Paul Rudd is delegated or regu- you know delegated down to like like a like a, a C level like a C plot right you know it's like not even the B plot right so it's all right standouts Phoebe and Ray are the standouts Ernie was good and believable and nice when he was there Peter was nice when he was there he makes a couple cracks Paul Rudd's fine when he's there the mom's fine there's no chemistry between the mom and Paul Rudd by the way. I just don't buy it. I'm not I'm not I'm not buying it. I just don't buy it. But overall, I did enjoy the film. I thought it was good. I had enough nostalgic factor that got me kind of excited and uh Bustin makes me feel good. There's a couple cheesy sh- some cheesy shit in there too. But overall, it worked for me. Out of 5 you digs, I would give Ghostbusters Frozen Empire 3.5 and that's my initial overreaction. Maybe it goes down next time because I don't know what re- rewatchability will be. I do believe it is a fast improvement on the last one. I did not really like Ghostbusters Afterlife. I liked this one significantly more, but didn't hold a candle to the original, of course. Didn't hold a candle to Ghostbusters 2, which I love. Um, well, I guess we're gonna have to look at um anyway i love ghostbusters one and two i didn't really like afterlife this is better than afterlife and way better than the 2016 one which i wanted to like but did not so 3.5 you digs what did you think about ghostbusters uh frozen empire almost said afterlife what did you think about the film let me know in the comments below or here in the live chat that has been your spoiler free review of ghostbusters frozen empire all right let's take a look at the chat who are you gonna call robbie station hell yeah Bobby De La Ghetto is in the house. He says, I ain't afraid of no frozen ghost. Chill Out Man says, I spent an entire year watching one movie, so I appreciate anything made to watch. I even enjoyed, dare I say it, the Power Rangers remake. Okay, okay, fair enough. Did it feel like watching a Disney movie, Robbie? It felt, it, it does have a, uh, it does have a family movie vibe and feel to it but afterlife had that too i think it improved on that actually i like the family aspect of it i like the legacy driven aspect of it this one works so much more for me than afterlife i did not want to watch this movie because of afterlife but uh my girlfriend actually watched it the other night and she said she liked it and she hadn't seen afterlife but she said she liked it and I am a Ghostbusters fan, and and it was nice. It was nice going back to the movie theater again. One of my first movie theater memories is going to see Ghostbusters 2 in the movie theater. So, it's special to me. But I came out of Ghostbusters Afterlife, like, not pissed, but, like, very disappointed. This one, I came out like, fuck, that wasn't too bad. (laughs) But, yeah, it does feel like a family movie. feels... 90s at time too it feels like a honey i shrunk the kids type vibe because i always thought ghostbusters was a scary movie i do think some of the ghosts might be scary to kids now but i think ghostbusters was scary to us because we were kids or maybe you weren't maybe you're a teenager i don't know chill out man you said you're older than me so 62 lefty blue says bill murray easiest check ever for a cameo no shit (laughs) Yeah, nine panel grid. Terrence McKenna, that would have been a very different movie. 
Nine Panel Grid, Easy Dick says, I think Frozen Empire was an improvement over Afterlife. It's not comparable to the OG, but I enjoyed the heck out of it. 3.69 backlogs. Nice. Oh, y'all know who Terrence McKenna is. Chill out, man. If you don't know who Terrence McKenna is, when we're done here tonight, just get on YouTube, type in Terrence McKenna on life. And just listen to those for a while and see what happens. Woody says, Slimer is awesome. Probably my fave. Hell yeah. Chill out, man. Says, I just Googled him. Would love to watch a movie with him. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here now, Woody. Too hot to handle, too cold to hold. They call the ghost buses because they're in control. Well, I guess we're gonna have to take control. Ah, 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 ah. If it's up to us, we've got to take it on. I'll tell you what. I know everybody loves their, who you gonna call? Ghostbusters! Ripping off Huey Lewis' ass. All right? Everybody loves that song. So do I. As soon as you hear the ba -na -na, I love it. By the way, that music's not utilized very well in here. Also, the end of the film does a great job of kind of capturing the energy of the ending of the first and the second. Where they end it, then they just have a bunch of little, like, clips. Also, the asshole from the previous two movies is like the mayor now? Like, what the fuck's up with that? That's funny. I like that. I liked the movie. I did. I had fun with it. I had a lot of fun with it. I enjoyed it. I wasn't expecting to. But I did. I can't lie. I could easily do a video here, like do a thing that I can clip out and just be shitting all over Ghostbusters. And it would be popular to do that right now. But I won't. I won't. Because I'm honest with who I am. And I'm comfortable with who I be. Just like it's easy for me to be like, X-Men 97 blew my world apart. It was the greatest thing ever. But I didn't feel that, so I can't do that. That's just not how it is. We have Manny in the house. Manny, great show today, man. I watched it after the fact because I was watching Ghostbusters, which I enjoyed, but I did watch it after the fact. Kudos to y'all for putting Exorcist 3 so high up on your list. That's awesome. Love y'all. Great video. Exorcist 3 is the shit, brother. Manny, I sent you a message, by the way, about the uh, PCP lineup. We are moments away, by the way, from revealing the lineup for PCP Movie Night for April and for Cruise Choice, which takes us from May into June. Also, there's a special bonus, $10 in Super Chat still to go. And we unlock a sneak peek at the next top-down comic book review, which is a Marvel comic from 1974. You don't want y'all. I want to give y'all the sneak peek. Come on. Oh, I got distracted. I know everybody loves that song from the first Ghostbusters. Me too. However, Bobby Brown on your on our own. That's the shit. That's the shit. I love Bobby Brown. I want to sing some Bobby Brown, y'all. He still has no dick. <laughs> Thanks to Ghostbusters 2, I ate my first marshmallow. I did not like it. Well, I like it. Yeah, did you toast it? Did you do the real thing? Hey, what's up, Brad? I haven't seen you in a live chat in a while. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you, man. You gotta toast that marshmallow. The way this is how I toast marshmallows. You catch that bitch on fire, and you just let it burn and get all black and crusty, and then you blow it out, and then you eat it, and you burn the fuck out of your mouth. It is my prerogative. I'll tell you what. I said ten more dollars in super chats. We're gonna do the unlock of the sneak peek of the next top down video, which is a Marvel comic from 1974 that I'm flipping through in person. I'll tell you what. Five dollars. Five dollars super chat. That gets unlocked and we sing some Bobby Brown. How about that? All right, we're taking a quick break. When we come back, we're going to reveal PCP movie night for April as well as May and June. That means we're revealing Cruise Choice. When we get back here on Rockin' Robbie 
Live.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Rockin' Robbie Live here on Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm your host, Rockin' Robbie Bills. We've already had a great show tonight talking about comics, movies, pop culture, and a whole lot more. We did the DC sneak peek. We talked about X-Men 97. I gave my spoiler-free review of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. It was good. I enjoyed it. I had fun with it. It was great. I read some YouTube comments. We're about to get back into reading some YouTube comments here, as well as the, the movie reveal for PCP Movie Night in April and May and June, which means the full reveal for PCP Movie Night, Crew's Choice, and Yes to Gun, even with that Page Master bullshit last year, Manny got a pick this year. It's only fair. He's part of the crew. So he, he gets a pick. He gets a pick. So that's dope. And, Ian, I see you. We'll get to that in just a second. I appreciate that. Um, Where was I? Follow me on X slash Twitter at the Rock and Robbie. Follow us at the PCP Army on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, it's the official PCP Facebook group. That's right, PCP Army. Somebody throw a link in the description or in the in the chat, please. Um, I am bourboned right now, y'all. I'm feeling loose as shit. Fuck yeah. This feels good. Maybe we should we should bring back the bourbon more often is what I should do. Anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, you can support the channel over at patreon.com slash PCP or by buying something off of the PCP studio upgrade list on my Amazon wish list. That is pinned to the top of the chat. Um, we're really looking for that cord right now, the 3.5 millimeter to the RCA. That's what we need to start making this work because I got VHSs. I want to do watch throughs as well. We're doing watch alongs on Patreon starting in April. So we need that piece of equipment. Um, also with super chat, you can drop a super chat, which helps us unlock cool sneak peeks here on rock and Robbie live. We have one that just got unlocked. We'll get to that in just a second. You can also support at patreon.com slash PCP, like these fine PCP patrons. I already said that. Instagram, find it. Yeah, we're on Instagram. I do Figgy Friday. We do that on Instagram. That's Fable's thing. We do that. And I always share on Facebook and the PCP Army on Twitter. I'm, I'm, I'm fucking done with Twitter. I only use Twitter to talk to comic book creators. And that fucked up. Like, nobody ever fucking likes my posts on Twitter. I don't even think I ever got to a thousand followers there. Damn. But on Instagram and on the PCP Army, you can uh, always stay abreast of what we're watching and what we're talking about and all that shit, all that good news, and interact with the uh, po the excitable PCP crew. Man, this bourbon. Is it hot in here? Woo! All right. <laughs> uh, check out all the links in the description below. There's lots of cool stuff coming up. We're in the final week of March Madness, so tomorrow night, 
PCP Movie Night, Spiral, 2007, co-directed by Adam Green. Such a great movie. Cannot wait to have that discussion. Manny is going to be talking about superheroes and demons colliding uh, with a look at Ghost Rider, the Spectre. Yes, he knows it's misspelled. I know it's misspelled. This is an old thumbnail I haven't I haven't updated. Uh, and also, we have demons. That's really cool. Um, Black Swan on Thursday night for Blood Splatter Chatter's finale for March Madness. And the official full finale over at Dylan's Horror Show. I'll be there to talk about Possession. I will be on Spiral, on Black Swan, and on Possession. But do not sleep on Manny's contribution to March Madness because he's been cranking out great, great content to celebrate the second most wonderful time of the year. All right, Ian with Super Chat taking us over the goal that was shrunk down just because i wanted to do it so thank you so much for helping us helping us out ian thanks for the show robbie always glad always glad when i can watch damn y'all Ugh, slow down robbie hold on let's take another sip of bourbon that will help thanks for the show robbie always glad when i can watch it live well thank you <laughs> Thank you so much for the Super Chat, Ian. We have unlocked the sneak peek at the latest top-down comic book review from a Marvel comic from 1974. That's going to happen momentarily, but first, let's get to some more comments from recent videos. This is from the recent weekly comic book review. What are your thoughts on the allegations of Andrea Sorrentino using AI in his comics? I find it weird he's made no statement, and it's been a while now. Before I get to my thoughts, number one, he did make a statement. When those accusations got flung up, he put up on IG a post of process. Like it's digital, right? He does digital art, but there's a post of his process of some of that issue in, in question. So I think that was his response. I don't know if Andrea Sorrentino is using AI. I don't know if other artists that have been accused of using AI have been using AI. Now, there was an AI-generated Spawn cover that won the Spawnuary shit, even though Todd McFarlane Productions said no AI allowed. That was a whole kerfluffle, right? They're gonna have to deal with the. Well, they're gonna have to deal with that, right? But I'll tell you what, that AI image was fucking awesome. There's a lot of AI imagery that's awesome. The problem is, comic book companies can't own it if it's generated by an AI program, so they definitely don't want to publish it. You know what I'm saying? So there's that. Here's the thing. This, I feel, is going to be... I don't like using these terms because it... I don't want to be associated with certain people that say certain terms like this. But I think the next witch hunt in comics is going to be to try to find people who are using AI and starting to accuse people. D 
do I personally think that Andrea Sorrentino is using AI art for instead of his art? No, not at all. I think Andrea is an incredibly talented artist who is experimenting with his style and it is rooted in a digital style. And there are certain textures that you can see that you will also see in AI art, right? But Andrew Sorrentino, there's no reason for this dude to cheat, right? Doesn't make sense to me. There's no reason for this dude because he's capable. He's been doing this for years and his style has evolved. And the week that this shit started coming out, he put out Tenement Number 10, which is beautiful. And amazing. Here's the thing. Are artists like Andrea or, or others using artificial intelligence as a tool? What's the difference between that and putting a Google image search in, taking a photo, flipping it, reverse it, all of a sudden you're tracing over it and you're making that image your own? What's the fucking difference? If you're using it as a tool, maybe like you, you, you put something in to generate some ideas, break some blocks. Maybe you use it to do something, but you make your own thing out of it. What's the difference between using AI as a tool like that as far as like taking somebody else's work, cutting out their background and using it? I mean, Todd McFarlane did that with Katsuhiro Otomo, right? There were, there are backgrounds from Akira that are used in his Spider-Man work or Batman. I think it's Spider-Man. But like, like, what's the difference? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't have fully realized thoughts right now on AI art and comics. I just know that right now there's this big thing where everybody's like, say no to AI art. And whenever everybody signs up to be on a certain side at the beginning of a discussion, I'm very wary of that. Okay. Cause there's, there are people who think that digital art is a shortcut and is fake and not real art. And I'm not saying that if an artist is just straight up using AI art to generate their books, that's shit. I don't think that's going to happen because I don't think an AI knows the sophistication, the sophisticated nuance of storytelling graphically. Maybe they do. Maybe they will. I don't know. And I don't know. I don't know if Sorrentino has been doing it. I don't know what, what's going on there. I personally just don't think that he was. I really respect this dude's art. I really love it. If he's using it, I think he's using it as a tool. And I think AI is a tool that's that's developing that we're going to have to get used to. So there's a lot of there's a lot of gradients and there's many layers to this conversation that I haven't fully thought out. But directly responding to the the allegations against Andrea Sorrentino. I don't think they're true. And I'm really worried about the next couple years because I do feel like there's going to be a lot of people throwing a lot of shit at a lot of artists claiming that their art is AI. And I think it's going to be sad. I think it's hard to decipher. I think it's an interesting conversation to have. And I think it's a developing conversation that we will have on this channel, and even on this show, as time progresses. And next time I have an artist on the channel, I'll start talking about it, because I want to hear their thoughts. Because I'm not a comic book artist. I'm not a cartoonist. So I, I want to have those conversations. So yeah, next time we have Tony Fleece on, or next time we have, who knows, anybody. But fuck, if we finally ever get Rob Life, we finally ever bag the fucking whale, the white whale, and we get... uh. Rob Liefeld on. I'll ask him. If we finally get the other white whale and get Todd McFarlane on, I don't know if I'm going to ask him because of everything going on. That being said, I don't think Andrea is doing it. I do think there's a lot of people in this industry who wish they were in the industry that will do whatever they can to tear others down. I'm not saying that's what's happening, but I'm saying it's not hard with people that work digitally to start accusing them of doing AI art. And I think that's going to be the biggest issue we're going to follow we're going to face coming up. All right. 
Same video, weekly comic book review. Brian Hill is writing Blade and Blood Hunt Midnight Suns for three issues. Look out for a number one relaunch after that. I agree with you, hip-hop happens. I think that's basically what's going to happen. Here's a long comment about the uh, my Marvel in the 60s clip that we did. We pulled out for uh, Amazing Fantasy 15. Lang Reeves says, I love Stan's sneakiness. Goodman didn't want them to do Spider-Man, so Stan puts it in in a last issue and asks the readers what they thought of Spider-Man, and tells them that there will be more stories about Spider-Man. So, of course fan letters came in, and the letters and the sales helped convince Goodman to let them do a solo series. I love reading the omnibus, the omnibus of Amazing Adult Adventures Fantasy. The early issues had Kirby as well as Ditko, but then Kirby got busy with the Fantastic Four. So the second half is just Lee and Ditko. It's fun to read these stories that were created right as the Marvel age was beginning. I highly agree. He goes on. I love Kirby. Amazing artist and storyteller and all around good guy. But I must confess, I wish they had used the Ditko cover for Adult Fantasy 15. The Ditko cover looks more fresh and dynamic. And well, it looks more like the Spider-Man inside the covers than the Spider-Man of almost 40 issues. True. As much as I love Kirby, his cover looks kind of golden age and static. Mm, ah, see, that's where I disagree. I think the Kirby is, uh, image is more dynamic. Uh, Kirby fans, please don't hate me. I don't hate you. Kirby is the one who contributed the most to the creation of the Marvel Pantheon. Without Kirby, well, I don't want to think about a world that didn't have Kirby. He's the king. Fuck yeah. I don't even want to think about a world that doesn't have Jack Kirby in it. Fuck yeah. On the uh, very first top-down video we did, Marvel Comics Presents number one, we got a comment recently. Please do more of these vids. Love Tom Sutton artwork. Hell yeah. We got a comment on the weekly review. Cobra Commander 3 was the best yet. The issue was like Quentin Tarantino-like perfection. Thanks for another great week. You're welcome. Speaking of Qbert, when are we going to get a Saturday Super K comic? That would be fucking awesome. Hell if I know. Because what's a mix between an elephant and a rhino? That's genius. Talking about Spider-Boy. Spider-Boy's way better than it should be. And then here's another one. I just noticed you missed Dark Horses. If you find this, I'm already dead. Issue 2 was out this Wednesday. It's 100% worth your time. More so than a lot of these DC and Marvel books. Yeah, I, I, I skipped on that one, but I, I, should, I should read it. I want to check it out. And my favorite comment, one of my favorite comments of the week. On my Profit Top Down number 1 video. Yes, please. Profit number 2. Okay. Maybe. That video didn't do so well. So if y'all want to see a profit number two, I think we need some more views on that video, y'all. Not to kayfabe it, but fuck. This Ed Piscor shit's actually true. Oh, I don't even want to... Th that fucking sucks. Uh, all right, let's take a look at the chat here before we uh, get on with it. I want to see y'all's comments on this. The new setup adding extra heat properly, Robbie. Do totally not the, the, the alcohol at all. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, y'all loving the Hellboy song. Singing along. I love that. All right. Eric says, artists using AI as a tool for reference is a net positive. Should lead to less copying and swiping. Using AI and claiming it as your own. A short-sighted, sure uh, surefire path to harm for working artists. I would agree with that statement 100%. Chill out, man says, I draw by hand, I'm doomed, and I'm not talking about the doctor. William says, when characters start going in public domain, all AI art will be reprinted since companies cannot own AI art. That's true. If there is AI-generated uh, art for Batman, Batman goes public domain in 10 years. Who knows what happens? Speaking of public domain shit, let me tell y'all something. Fuck, there's a new issue of Savage Dragon out this week. What the fuck, man? Eric Larson is, I don't know if he's just a creepy fucking dirty old man now, or if he's just like, fuck it, let's just push the boundaries of comics. Let's like push the boundaries of taste, but I am all here for it, 100%. The newest issue of Savage Dragon has got Mickey Mouse in it again, and he's like fucking violating a woman and shit. Like, it is fucking twisted. <laughs> and right up my fucking alley. Not that I like violating women. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, like, just pushing boundaries with your art. Jesus Christ. Savage Dragon is fucking wild. It is not the Savage Dragon that I 
I did not too long ago on Image in the 90s, where we covered the first three issues of Savage Dragon. It is a way different book, but I've been getting into it recently, and it's one of those few books that's been going on for so long that I've been so detached from that I can just jump back in, and it gives me that sense what it used to be like getting into comics. Like, I don't know everything that's going on in the world of Savage Dragon. I don't know the full history right now in the current issues, but I've been reading like the last few and I'm starting to pick it up. And that's how comics are. So like, stop with the reboots already. There's a woman in the new issue of Savage Dragon who's like, a, there's two of them. They're spider women. And they're literally shooting spider webs out of their vaginas. I'm not lying. And you fucking see it. And then Mickey Mouse is there like, fingering that chick what the fuck is going on in savage dragon i don't know but he ain't using ai i guarantee you that and it is some of the roughest most frantic eric larson art i've ever seen i heard that he like times himself to ink so he's efficient he only gives himself so much so many minutes or whatever to to ink a page and it, it doesn't look as refined but it does it does look raw and raw and in all kinds of gnarly ways Bobby says, art is in the AI of the beholder. I see what you did there, buddy. Mad Bomber says, it's not about whether AI is good enough or a tool to use. The issue is that the AI is trained on stolen art. Therefore, using AI is monetizing stolen art from artists who are not compensated. I get that vibe, but did Andrea Sorrentino... So if, if Andrea Sorrentino used AI, did he put his own style in there? Like... Like, and then, then what's going on? Can an artist use AI generated art of their own art? Does that correct the fucking thing? I don't know. There's a lot of nuance there. Here's the thing. I don't like the idea that someone can go right, draw me this in the style of Casper Wingard or George Perez or some shit like that. But I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't have a full enough thought. I do think it can be a tool that can be used. Hey, AI, give me a three... Uh, a three-point perspective view, worm's eye of a diner. Maybe that can help you with a background or something. You don't have to rule out fucking... Nobody does that anymore. Everybody used to... Here's the thing. You used to rule out... You have to rule out perspective lines, right? Across this giant thing. Like, Jeff Darrow still does that. He, he has these lines that go all the way the fuck out here, right? But, like, now you just do that digitally. Boom. Some people say that's cheating. I, I, I don't know. I don't know the nuance. I'm not an artist. I'm not a comic artist. Now, here's the idea. The, the, if a style's being stolen, for sure, I understand that part of it, 100%. But I can't make any distinction distinction about AI, AI art right now just because I need to, like, I need to, I need to actually have a chat with more artists. So maybe that's something I should do this year is have more artists on the channel and that'd be part of the conversation. I'd love to hear it. The name changes says, would love to see you interview Todd McFarlane. Prophet. Two Gun Pedro says, I might have to start commenting on Rock and Robbie's videos, hoping he'll read and answer it on a Rock and Robbie Live. Go for it. That's that's what I'm going to start doing. I've never read the Prophet book. Not interested. Sorry, Home Slice. No problem. <laughs> Prophet's fucking awesome, by the way. So what happens when DC and Marvel top characters go public domain? Is that any concern for the company's financial draw? Yeah, a little bit, I'm sure. They'll still make it the, the official Superman and Batman books, but I don't know. You know, they kept Mickey Mouse out of public domain for a long time. But here's the thing. Superman and Batman go public domain. It's only the Golden Age version of those characters. It's not going to be everything that was built on. Then you get all these lawsuits. Oh, you used Batarang. That didn't happen until blah, 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 blah. Oh, you used kryptonite. That didn't happen until blah, blah, blah. Oh, you used this. Like, so it's a whole goddamn thing. So when Superman pop pops up when it goes in public domain and you got Superman in your comic flying around, you fucked. Superman didn't fly. That's not going to be the Superman. You get one of, There's all kinds of shit. Name changes says, nah, I pass hard on Savage Dragon. Fair enough. Most, most respectable people of society should probably pass on Savage Dragon, but I'm having a fucking hoot with it right now. 
It's good to see you, Manny. I love you, bro. Respond to my Facebook message, please. I should have texted you. Anissa says, as a person that works in cyber and computers, the thing is, it's just impossible to stop. Ethically wrong in certain instances, yes, but technology unchecked will only bring people who take advantage. That's true. What do y'all think? You think Sorrentino's using AI art? I don't think so. I don't think he is. But at the same time, I don't know. I don't know. R. Ariaga says, I hope I can do, uh, I love the Stephen Platt profit run. Hope you can do some videos of those issues. I want to. We got to get through four damn Panosian issues first. All right, y'all. We're about to reveal the PCP movie night lineup for May and June, as well as April. So April, which you haven't gotten yet, and May and June, which is Crew's Choice. And we're doing something special with Crew's Choice this year. I've revealed it on a few live streams. But let's go ahead and get to April 1st. All right, here's your here's here's the the unveiling. Y'all ready? April 1st. We've got cats here on the channel. Yeah. There was a live stream me Brooks and Jelani were doing like in 2019 or something. And we were like, "Hey, if y'all want to see us do uh, do cats, uh super chat is 25 bucks." Somebody did and we never did it. So we're doing it. So April 1st, Cats. So next week, Cats. The week after that, Gladiator. A Ridley Scott movie that I absolutely adore. Very excited to talk about this one. The week after that, Yo Jimbo. That's right. We're still talking about some of our best favorite directors in cinema history. Ridley Scott, now Akira Kurosawa. We're talking about Yo Jimbo. And then A Serious Man. This is a very underappreciated and underdiscussed Coen Brothers film. It is the most personal film they've ever done, and I, I am here for it. I love this movie. After that, we're doing Kung Pao. Enter the Fist. We're doing this because my boy, the Tiger Kid, that's right, professional wrestler Tiger Kid is going to be here to review his favorite movie, Kung Pao. So that's the April lineup. Let's run through it again. Starting next Monday night. Cats. The following week, Gladiator. The following week, Yojimbo. The next week, A Serious Man. The week after that, Kung Pao. Enter the Fist. All right, before we get to May and June, let me explain something. May and June represents Cruise Choice. Now, I have a birthday at the beginning of Cruise Choice. My birthday is May 10th. So I always like to start Cruise Choice with my own pick for my birthday. I got a good pick for my birthday this year. And then we always do Jelani's pick right before his birthday. So this year, we got picks from me, Brooks, and Jelani, and Joe Corallo, and Manny, and Mike, and... Hammer Time Whole Shoe. And we've added a pick for our dude Fable. All right, but here's the thing. We got Cats. We got Gladiator. We got Yojimbo. We got a serious man. And we got Kung Pao, Enter the Fist. That's a great April. But this year for Cruise Choice, it's Cruise Choice. Tom Cruise. Everybody gets their pick, but it's got to have Tom Cruise in it. So here we go for Cruise Choice. You get it? You get what we did there? Really funny. Me and Hammer Time Holshu. Actually, Hammer Time Holshu came up with the idea during Scarefest, and I was like, no, that's not just a bullshit idea. We're fucking doing it. So my pick for my birthday is Days of Thunder, a movie I loved when I was a kid that I think is going to be terrible rewatching as an adult, but my pick for Cruise Choice is Days of Thunder. Then for Brooks, he picked Risky Business. Next up, we have Legend. This is Joe Corallo's pick, and it's specifically Legend, the director's choice, or the director's cut. Next up is Jelani's pick. He picked Tropic Thunder. A lot of people said, is that really a Tom Cruise movie? I said, you know what? He's in it. Jelani fulfilled the, the assignment, so let's do it. After that, we got Fable's pick 
Minority Report. That's a really good movie based on a Philip K. K-, 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 Philip K. Dick short story directed by Steven Spielberg. After that, we got Manny's pick, Interview with the Vampire. And then after that, we got Hammer Time Whole Shoes pick with Oblivion. I have never seen this movie, so I'm excited to check it out. And we wrap it up with Mike's pick, Collateral, a Michael Mann film starring Jamie Foxx and Tom Cruise that I absolutely love. So, starting in April, we got Cats. Then we're back. That's our April 1st show, right? It's a fulfillment of a promise. And then we go back to some of our favorite filmmakers. We got Gladiator by Ridley Scott. Yojimbo by Akira Kurosawa. A Serious Man by the Coen Brothers. And then we got the Tiger Kid here to talk about one of his favorite movies, Kung Pao. Enter the Fist. And then Crew's Choice. Robbie's pick, Days of Thunder. And Brooks's pick, Risky Business. Joe Corallo's pick, Legend, The Director's Cut. Jelani's pick, Tropic Thunder. Fable's pick, Minority Report. Manny's pick, Interview with the Vampire. Hall Shoe's pick, Oblivion. And Maniacal Mike's pick, Collateral. And that's your PCP lineup for April, May, and June. And then don't forget about Cruise Choice. Well, Hammer Time, maybe you can come over here. Maybe we can watch Days of Thunder on the big screen too, bro. I need you on Days of Thunder, bro. I want you on my birthday stream. Whole shoe, I'm putting you down for Days of Thunder. I don't give a shit what you're doing. For my birthday week, you're doing Days of Thunder. Hammer time. You said you were in Japan after my birthday. You told me it was after my birthday. This is before my birthday. It's the week of my birthday. The Monday before my birthday, bro. It's the first Monday of May. Come on, brother. I'm putting you down. You're going to be there. Even if you're in Japan, God damn it. It'll be 8 in the morning. I don't know what the, the time difference is, but you're going to be there. Come on, whole shoe. I love you. I miss you. I want to hang out with you, man. All right, y'all. Let's take a look at these comments. April Fool's, yeah. That is an April Fool's joke. It'll be another film. I am serious as fuck, y'all. We're doing cats. The April Fool's joke was supposed to be on Jelani because I told Jelani it was going to be an audience poll and then it got, like, backstage one day, it got spoiled. Nine Panel Grid says, dope lineup. Hell yeah, thank you so much. Ari Ariaga says, I'll check the cat show just for the comments. It'll be brutal. I'll tell you what. When we shared the April lineup with the panelists, it was the first one to fill up was cats. I'm not even kidding. It's going to be me, Jelani, and Brooks, and Manny, and Joe Corallo, and Fable. That's going to be fucking fun. Chill out, man. Says Tiger Kid. It's about time he came on. Hell yeah, he's number one, baby. Do you have a movie you watch every year for your birthday? No, it's always a different one. This year is Days of Thunder <laughs> and Nightmare Sisters. We're doing Nightmare Sisters for my birthday right before that on Dylan's Horror Show. So that's going to be fun. June needs to be Jackie Chan films. June's going to be the rest of Cruise Choice. Then we go into Action Fest. Eric says, surprise, the infinitely quotable A Few Good Men did not make the cut. Well, nobody picked it. 
Edge of Tomorrow would have been a good pick. We already did Edge of Tomorrow. That was one that was off limits. Uh, my first pick was Vanilla Sky. That's my favorite Tom Cruise movie. But I went with Days of Thunder because... Why the fucking not? <laughs> Everybody else was picking these really good films like Minority Report and fucking Interview with the Vampire. And I was like, fuck it. We're going Days of Thunder, motherfuckers. <laughs> All good roles, but Tom Cruise shines in Tropic Thunder. <laughs> I can't believe no one picked The Mummy 2017. I've never seen that one still. Color of Money is a great one. That was another one I thought about picking. I love The Color of Money. Martin Scorsese film, sequel to The Hustler. Chill Out Man says, I, why the fuck not? I love it, Robbie. When I was a kid, I loved Days of Thunder, and I even collected all the fucking cars from like hardy's and shit and mike the voice matthews actually hooked me up with three of the four little fucking cars so yeah we're doing days of thunder let's let's roll through that again y'all cats for april then gladiator love this movie best picture winner yo jimbo we gotta we gotta dive more into some kurosawa here on the channel a serious man the most underappreciated Coen Brothers movie out there. I fucking love it. Jelani's going to hate the ending. I guarantee you. Kung Pao, Enter the Fist, Tiger Kid's favorite movie. Let's talk about it. Days of Thunder for Cruise Choice. That's Robbie's pick. Risky Business is Brooks's pick. Let me tell you something about Brooks's pick, too. Brooks goes, I cannot give a shit less about Tom fucking Cruise. And I was like, what about Risky Business? He's like, I've never seen Risky Business. Let's do that. So that's why he picked it. Uh, Joe Corallo picks Legend, the director's cut. That's a dope-ass fucking film. Jelani picked Tropic Thunder. I'm excited to revisit that one. I have not seen that since it first released. Minority Report is Fable's pick. It was also Brian's pick, so it's kind of like a co-pick. But, man, I do love that movie. Interview with the Vampire. Been a long time. I saw this movie in theaters. It was interesting. Like I cannot wait to see it. I haven't seen it in a long-ass time. Oblivion is Hammer Time Whole Shoes pick. I've never seen that one. And then Collateral is a, a favorite of mine, a Michael Mann film. That is Mike's pick. All right. Blood Splatter Chatter's in the house. What's up, my dude? Someone please share out. Please share the uh, link to Blood Splatter Chatter where I will be on Thursday night where you can catch us talking about Black Swan. Such a good show. Such a good episode. Cannot wait for that to drop. All right. You asked for it. You earned it. You paid for it. Here is your next sneak peek at a full, top-down, bottoms-up episode. We're talking about a Marvel comic from 1974. Fuck, here you go. Y'all have earned this. So let's do it. Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're going to take a look inside Marvel 2-in-1, number one. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. Today we're going to be cracking into this Marvel 2-in-1, issue number one, featuring the Thing and the Man Thing. So this is a series, Marvel 2-in-1, ran for 100 issues and some annuals. It started in 1974. It went all the way through 1983. And what it basically served was it served as a team-up book featuring the Thing, Ben Grimm, from the Fantastic Four, and each issue would be in like an ongoing solo thing story, but it would also feature another hero or sometimes villain or anti-hero from Marvel Comics, right? And what better place to start than with the thing meeting the man thing. So this is the very first time that the thing and the man thing meet together monster against monster while a world trembles. This is written by Steve Gerber, who most people will know as the creator of Howard the Duck. It's got artwork by Gil Kane with inking by Joe Sinnott. What a fantastic team. This is the first time that I've read this issue because I started picking these up. I found this copy. It's a low-grade copy of Marvel 2-in-1 number one. At the time I picked it up, it was like five or six bucks. Super cheap. And I said, you know what? 
why not build up this run? I am a huge fan of The Thing because I'm a huge fan of the Fantastic Four and I had never read any of this stuff and I wanted to check it out. And there are trade paperback editions of it. Like there's some Masterworks, I think. Maybe there's some other trades out there. I don't know if they did an Epic collection or if maybe they have. I'm not 100% sure. But this was cheap enough and I said, let me build this run and I don't have every single issue, but I do have a lot of issues, including a lot of the first issues that I can kind of go ahead and start going through this series here with you on the channel. So let's just dive in, open it up and take a look at this beautiful, beautiful artwork from Gil Kane and Joe Sinnott. Now, Joe Sinnott, we will mostly know as a famed inker of Jack Kirby. In fact, I was having a conversation earlier today about Jack Kirby inkers, right? We were talking about Sinnott, we were talking about Ayers, we were talking about Coletta, we were talking about Royer, and all the different things we liked about their work. And Joe Sinnott's one of my absolute favorites because he gives me this, like, very classic Fantastic Four kind of vibe. I really feel like when Joe was inking Jack that it really kind of solidified the look of the thing, no pun intended, but it works for me and the art is astounding. Gil Kane is a masterclass storyteller. You'll know his work from Hal Jordan Green Lantern stuff. He's the co-creator of that character. He also had a great, a great run on Spider-Man in the post 100s. Um, he was the co-creator of Morbius. He was was the co-creator of The Punisher. He did the death of Gwen Stacy and the Green Goblin. So lots of iconic Spider-Man work as well. And I didn't know that he was doing the work here, but what a great team. And Steve Gerber on the... Uh the writing, so let's get right into it. This is a silly Marvel story, so it has a silly kind of premise. But it starts off, the thing is in New Mexico or something like that. He has no way to get back to New York, so he's bought a bus ticket and he picked up a, a Times magazine or something, right? And he notices the debut of The Thing, right? And to put this in context, it says 1973, but this was published in January of 74. And that's the same year that Wolverine was introduced. So that puts you in the context, in the context of the time. Um, the colors are pretty solid. They're pretty by the numbers here on the book. But I do love how they present on this newsprint. That works tremendously well for me personally. Um, so he finds out there's this new being called the Man-Thing. And he's claiming plagiarism. He's like, I'm the only thing. He's super, super mad. The name of the story is Vengeance of the Molecule Man, so I'm excited to get some Molecule Man action. He's a Fantastic Four villain that's not used so often in the books of the Fantastic Four, but is very important to Marvel Secret Wars, whether it's the one from the 80s or the one that Hickman did, like, I don't know, almost 10 years ago at this point. So he's pissed off about it, just starts wrecking this poor dude's shop. This dude's like, what did I do? Why is the, what, what's wrong? He's like, it's nothing you did, it's the magazine. He goes, what, you mean it's unwholesome? But that can't be, I don't allow such. And the thing goes, nah, it's not porno, it's plagiarism. I love this, this might be one of the first Marvel comics that I've read that uses the word porno. Um, and it's from 1974, I guess, or 73 when they, I guess they were making this, but that makes sense to me. So he's talking to this dude. He's like, yo, I want a bus ticket, not to New York, but to Florida, because I'm going to go talk to this man thing and get all this stuff sorted out. So he winds up taking the bus, and I love this bit here where the dude, after the thing is leaving on the bus, says, I've been a good man, a religious man. I've done an honest business here for 41 years. So why me, Lord? Why did you send him to me? <laughs> so I absolutely love that. He's on the bus. Look at this super fearful look on this dude's face with the thing behind him. This dude just looks angry. Really cool. Really clunky panel here. But what's happening here is that the thing is reminiscing about his recent adventures. He's abandoned in New Mexico with no way back to New York. I guess he can't just call the Fantastic Four, call up the Baxter building on the private line, tell Reed, yo, shoot over here in the Pogo plane and pick me up or whatever. But nope, that's not how it works. So he's reminiscing about this team up he had with the Hulk and a team up he had with Iron Man. Now that's in Marvel feature number 11, Marvel feature number 12. So that means that something I didn't know until reading this, and that's the beauty of these editorial um, little little uh, tidbits here with the asterisks, right? What do you call them? Footnotes, footnotes. The editorial footnotes um, by Roy Thomas. And I love how the little bits of like, he's RT on this one, he's Roy in that one. So yeah, Roy Thomas is the editor of this. I don't know if he's editor-in-chief at this time. He might be. There is no editor-in-chief listed, 
maybe Stan's still there, but it may have already been turned over to Roy. Um, if you know in the comments, please let me know. But I didn't know that this was a follow-up to a book called Marvel Feature, which apparently had some thing team-up books. So I guess I gotta try to hunt those down. So he's reminiscing and just kind of catching you up on the story. Now, a lot of people will read old comics and they see stuff like that and they think it's kind of annoying or they think it's repetitive or obnoxious. And if you read them in big chunks, it can do that. But kind of like something like He-Man and the Masters of the Universe or G.I. Joe, when you watch those old cartoons, right? As fun as they are, as nostalgic, as they can be, as memorable as they are to us and our childhoods. If you binge through that stuff, it can really wear you down because they're not necessarily the best way to... They can, they can wear you down. But when you take it one at a time, you like stuff like this. And, you know, the idea of every comic book could be somebody's first... That applies here. I don't, I've never read Marvel Feature 11 or 12. I didn't even know about these stories, but now I'm enticed to pick them up. And that's something that the continuity driven nature of the Marvel Universe, that's what really sucked people in and kept them there and held them. Look at the amazing shading and the ink work on the thing. Joe Sinnott does such an amazing job on the thing. He might be my favorite inker on the thing, period. And maybe one of the reasons why I love his inking on Kirby so much, I love these big, thick lines, this great feathering that he does. It just seems so effortless, but everything is purposefully put there. The thing is one of those characters that you can ink kind of haphazardly at times, but when you do, it you can kind of tell. And even if certain things are accidental in nature, look at the texture that you're given right here on the shoulder with the highlights. Look at the uneven nature you see of the rock. So it doesn't look just super smooth. It looks kind of chunky. I really like that look for the thing. So he's on his way to Florida. Old ads make you a master of karate. I doubt it. I doubt it. Get your free glamorous ice cologne and cream sachet worth $6. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so now we're going to go to a whole other planet in a whole other cosmos other than our own is what is described here. This is a whole other reality in which time moves differently, right? So you have the Molecule Man here who's now an older man and dying, and he has a son. I didn't know that the Molecule Man had a son. Like, at all. Like, I didn't realize that that was part of the story back in the day. But he's talking about how the Fantastic Four sent him to this... Re or the Fantastic Four stopped him. The Watcher sent him to this reality. Because as the sun says, because we live in a different space-time continuum from Earth, and time moves faster here, the Molecule Man is aging faster. While my foes are yet young and strong... And he's like, but that's why he's like, yes, the Watcher planned it that way when he exiled me. So he's blaming the Fantastic Four. He's reminiscing about that. They delivered him into the Watcher's hand. The Watcher put him on this earth where time runs differently so that as he's aging, the Fantastic Four is still younger because time's slower there. So that's going on. But he's on his deathbed and he's reminiscing. And then he tells his son to please avenge him. And then he dies. The Molecule Man dies? What? What? When did that happen? Well, apparently in 1974 in Marvel 2 and 1 number 1. I didn't even know that. So now I'm tripping out thinking, so is this dude, the son of the Molecule Man, about to become the new Molecule Man? And is that the Molecule Man that we know? And I'm like, no, because we know it's Owen what? Is that a different Molecule Man? Now I'm all tripped out in my head thinking I don't know anything about the Molecule Man. So I got to do a deep dive into that history of that character. But you get the swearing of vengeance from this dude. Him and his father have worked on a new thing to recreate the experiment that gave the Molecule Man his powers. But this time it will actually do it without giving him the weakness of not being able to affect organic molecules. The powers of the Molecule Man is that he can control and transform anything made with molecules. The original Molecule Man, only inorganic molecules. This dude gets imbued with a power right here um, and, and in order to safely use it against organic and inorganic molecules. So now that weakness is gone, but a new weakness will pop up, you'll see. I just want to point out this uh, this page. I love this page. I love the color. You Look at the use of the red in the foreground, the blue in the background. What that does is it pops this figure out, lets us know or feel the rage and the vengeance inside of them, and it show, it separates that background from the foreground, so it pops out on all of these pages. Even right here, it's just the setting, right? But even right here where he's being infused with that power, and look at how balanced it is. It's every other panel, it switches. 
you could think of this like if this was done cinematically where the lights like shifting or changing it's a really cool effect that i absolutely love i love 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 this page this is some classic style inking you'll see stuff like this in ec comics you'll see stuff like this is just a very clean and precise style of inking over what gil kane is doing and gil kane excellent at the perspectives and the angles on the faces making things different with interesting angles like i've already said great settings here great faces it just keeps everything moving and the angular nature of these panels just kind of i don't know it gives it this nice sense but it's also very definitively marvel in the 70s kind of feeling um you want some uh, lps or tapes for uh, only a dollar look at that al green marvin gay that's pretty dope stevie wonder Moody Blues, James Brown. It's pretty dope. All right. So he gets imbued with this new power right here. Look how the color changes, but we're still utilizing that red and blue effect with that yellow. It's It works. It works really, really well. So he now has all of this power. The Molecule Man lives once more. I can feel it. Nothing about me is as it was. Even my simple robes have been transformed to a more fearsome manner of garb. Yeah, that's fearsome, bro. You went from wearing, like, occultish-looking robes to a Speedo, some boots, and a weird, like, lightning bolt thing on your chin. Like, what? this is fearsome. If you show up on Earth like this, people are going to think you're nutty. So he grabs his wand, and he transports himself to where the Fantastic Four is going to be, and he starts with Ben Grimm the thing. But he pops up in the Everglades, in the Everglades over in Florida, right? Why has he popped up there? He should be in New York, but he's popping up there. We know because the thing is on his way there. But as he's there, the man thing shows up. The macabre man thing. Freaks the dude out. He drops his wand, starts, az starts aging rapidly because he's from a universe in which time moves faster than the time here on this earth, the 616. So... His body is still connected to that time speed. So whenever he's not able to control it with the staff, he's aging rapidly. So we already got built in the way that we're going to defeat him. It's easy. It's simple. But remember, these are comics that are made for kids, and a con but at the same time, leveled up a little bit through the art and through some of the storytelling and some of the tragic figures. It ages it up just a little bit. So it's not just for kids, but at the same time, it's it's setting up very simple tales that you can do at a, at a steady pace and at a quick pace, right? So we already got that in. He's aging. He's going to pick up the wand. This is interesting. So this, this, let me, real quick, let me just break this down. Strategies and tactics. It's a magazine. It's also a tool, a time machine that enables you to replay the crucial events past, present, and future that shape our lives. Now, instead of merely reading about what's happening, you can explore and experience the alternatives and decision-making points through the technique of conflict simulation. This is before video games. This is just something you read in a magazine. Interesting. First one you get is Napoleon at Waterloo. That's pretty neat, I guess. I, I, I read this whole ad. It totally distracted me when I was reading this issue, but I liked it. All right, so he picks up the new Molecule Man, son of the Molecule Man, picks up the wand. It reverses the process. He's young again. There's the man thing, but he can sense that the man thing is doesn't have a lot of intelligence, right? It says, his terror now abated. The Molecule Man turns his gaze back to the monstrous man thing, who has stood watching the drama of life and death in silent uncomprehension, for he lacks the ability to think, to reason, even to speak. He can only feel, and even then, it's not his own emotions, but those of the beings around him. He is one of nature's cruelest jests, a spawn of chemistry and sorcery gone mad. So, Molecule Man just dismisses him, and he goes about his day, but the Man-Thing is a little bit curious and starts kind of following him. Love the use of the panels to break it up, that vertical panel to show us down that way. And then we cut to the Thing. Real quick, though, back to the Man-Thing. This is probably going to be a lot of people's first introduction to the man thing. People that didn't necessarily read uh, Fear Magazine or whatever it was that he first showed up in, right? There's a few different things, right? I think they reference them in this issue later on. And this is a good just, this is who the man thing is. You understand. It's very quick. It's very efficient. And I know that with the today's decompressed storytelling where things are meant to be maybe a little bit more cinematic, it's not something that's 
it can't be used necessarily in this way through like purple prose and stuff like that, but it does have a kind of charm to it that's very much a part of the 70s into the 80s. Maybe it gets a little bit more overbloated, but there is something special about the 70s writers. We're talking about the Len Weens, the Marv Wolfmans, the Steve Englehart. There's something about it that make it work and not go overboard with it that like, for instance, Chris Claremont or even John Byrne a couple years later can do at the same time. Now, Chris Claremont, obviously a writer around this time too. It was a little bit different, but what that kind of becomes throughout the 80s it kind of gets a little bit more uh, a little bit more obnoxious but over time but also you know I just read real I know I don't have too much exposure to man thing especially classic man thing so this is like the closest to I mean he's got to be a newish character I think around the time that this is published I don't remember the exact year that the man thing debuted I'm sure somebody in the comments can let me know um but having read that Marvel Comics Presents number one, you know, a few weeks ago, and now reading this, like, I want to dive into that Man-Thing stuff. I need to get a hold of the classic run. I know there used to be a trade paperback. Maybe there is now. I'm not sure. So the thing is there. Um, thing is just such a... One thing I've learned about reading this is I forgot how much of a grump and grouch the thing used to be. He has definitely evolved as a character, and he kind of has more of this kind-hearted charm about it. And he did back then, but... He's kind of calmed down a little bit in his older age, but back then, man, he, is the, he wrecks that whole dude's shop because of a magazine. Here he's demanding to get off the bus before the stop. The dude refuses it, and he's like basically threatening him to let him off the bus. Um, so that's cool. He shows up, and he just knows that the man thing, I guess, is in this area. I guess it was in there. He Geronimo's down, drops down right where he needs to be because all of a sudden he gets wrapped up by these vines and it's the Molecule Man. So he just goes right to where the Molecule Man is, which makes sense because the Molecule Man kind of set himself up to be there with the thing. They get into a little bit of a tussle. He finds out what's going on. He recognizes Molecule Man's son and mentions, Thing mentions that it's been five years since they've seen him. So interesting with the time slide. In 1973, we're 12 years away from the debut of the Fantastic Four. In continuity, they're referencing it as at least like probably six or I mean it's almost feels like it's more in real time than what the sliding time scale gets to a uh, molecule man uses his powers crazy he could obviously just use his powers to turn the molecules of the thing into air and he's done he's dead but he doesn't do that he just kind of plays around with them a little bit makes like a force field all that stuff then the man thing shows up and understands through the feeling of the imp like the man thing can sense the feelings. He's empathic, right? He can sense the feelings of others. He senses this dude's an evil guy. He jumps in, throws the dude. He freaks out, realizes he's about to die. He, he could, could he not just make himself fly, give himself wings? But what he does is he turns the, the bridge here, or the concrete of the structure, he turns the molecular structure into something foamy and cushiony. He bounces back. <laughs> and then he's like, you know what? It occurs to me there are more ways to kill a man than physically. So he uses his powers to turn Thing and the Man-Thing back to their human form, Ben Grimm and Ted Salas. There we go, Monsters Unleashed number three and Fear number 13, respectively. Ted Salas doesn't have any recollection of being the Man-Thing. That's interesting. He talks to Ben. They have a little bit of a conversation. He catches Ted up on what's going on. He's like, but we got to go back to being blasted freaks or the rest of the FF's going to die. And this is an element I love, and this has been done before in comic books, in movies, in animated series, where Ben finally does get changed back to human, but the only way to save the day is to allow himself to be reverted back to the thing, and it shows the true courage of heroism um, of Benjamin J. Grimm. Even with the bluster of his personality, he still has a good heart and is truly going to do the right thing and sacrifice his own happiness for the safety of others. Here's a letters page about Marvel features. So once again, this is just kind of a continuing idea with a new number one, jumping it to a new title. I think Marvel 2 and 1 sounds better. This ran for 100 issues. So I don't know what sales were like on this book, but they had to be pretty decent, right? So now the Molecule Man is trying to go to New York to kill the rest of the Fantastic Four, and he can't get the wand to work, and he thinks there's a malfunction, but what it is, and there's a note here, and I love this. Once again, Steve Gerber didn't have to do this. He could have tried to force it into the story in some other way or cleverly let us know, but he straight up just does a nice, fun little note. No, the malfunction is not in the wand, but in the swamp. For here, at the nexus of mystic forces, the laws of science oft go awry, as in the accident that birthed the man-thing himself. So I really do like that. 
They're running around. Ted's like, don't give up hope. We got to take care of it. We got it. You know, I may not be as smart as Reed Richards, but let's find a lab. Maybe I can find some chemicals that will help us out. So that's what they're doing right there. Really solid stuff. Very efficient storytelling. I love the foliage here. I, it's just the backgrounds, the density of it, and all done on a deadline, on a schedule, consistently well. All right, so the Molecule Man winds up finding the same town that Ben and Ted just found, and he's now realizing that the wand is working again because he's away from this nexus of realities. There's really... I guess the reason to have this whole Nexus of Reality thing is so that you keep him there. Otherwise, he would just whisk himself away to New York. And now you got to like deal with how the thing and man thing get there. So he's just going to walk to New York, by the way. But he finds this other town, tests out his wand. He's changing the city. He's changing everything around. Uh, ben and Ted see it. And he's like, bah, this is but an exercise, a kind of sport. I wield the power to reshape the very cosmos. Then reshape the cosmos where the Fantastic Four aren't there. But you know what? Then we wouldn't have this nice, fun story with all this. Here's one of the most wonkiest things in this issue. To prove his powers, let me demonstrate further a preview of the agony that awaits the th X Things partners. Watch Ben Grimm. I will begin with this nobody. He takes this dude, molecularly changes him to the image of Reed Richards, and then kills him. He kills him. No, no, please let me be. I ain't done nothing to hurt you. <laughs> and then he stretches him so freaking thin. What a gnarly panel. Like, seriously, if you're a kid reading this, and all you know is, like, wholesome Fantastic Four stories, and you've never seen the thing, I mean, the Mr. Fantastic be ripped like that, and then his head just rip and pop? And look at the great lettering right here as we see the ERG effect just, like, oh, man. It's just freaking awesome storytelling right here. And actually rather gnarly for 1973 in a Marvel book. So he just kills this dude. He just kills this dude. Death, the one state of matter even I cannot alter. So the thing's ruining it. He comes at him. And then like a jackass, completely idiotic, the Molecule Man's son uses his power to turn the thing back into the thing. In your human form, there's a quality of nobility about you that troubles me. I prefer you as the orange-skinned buffoon. And the thing even says, fella, you just made the mistake of your life. And he comes at him. He's chained. Oh, this ain't going to stop me. He's still running. Ted's like, what are we going to do? He's like, get out of my way. And then you've given me an inspiration. He turns Ted back into the man thing. All right. Turns Ted back into the man thing. There we see it right there. And the man thing just knows. Last thing he knows is that this dude threw him to the ground. So he tries to attack him. Thing punches the man thing. This is the big fight. One moment. Gets hit by the Man-Thing. Looks like he dodges out of it. Then he punches the Man-Thing. Goes right through. He goes, Cripes, you're not even flesh and blood. Just ooze. I ain't even sure you're alive exactly. You're just what you look like. A walking mound of sludge. No one ought to have to live like this. This dude's like, ha ha. Do you know how comical it is to see one monster uh, have pity at the plight of another? And then he throws some of this mud at the Molecule Man which knocks the wand away from him and very far away from him. And he can't get there. He's trying. He's like, I need my wand. So, and he's like, you laugh, you joke, you make a mockery of me, even as my flesh grows brittle and withered, even as I waste away before you. And Thing goes, shucks, you'd have done the same for me. Think nothing of it. Sides, you don't want a monster's pity, do you? He's like, I want the wand. Help me, please. And look at that gnarly bit where he just turns, ages, turns to a skeleton, and then in just dust. Creepy and awesome and cool. And then there he goes. I must be nuts. I just let the one guy who could cure me turn to ashes. Unless maybe tries to use that wand on him. Doesn't work. Tries to use it on the man thing. Doesn't work. Gives the wand to this kid and then decides, well, time to get back to New York. And you might as well have this Cracker Jack toy. It won't do me a bit of good. And then the thing just goes back to New York. The man thing just walks back into the swamp. And this kid, hey, mom, dad, look, look what the brick man gave me. Look it. I'm the king of the universe, master of the world. Wee. This man would grow up to be Leonardo DiCaprio. And he would star. Look at that evil Knievel ad. He would star in 
Never mind. That was a bad joke. Anyway, Marvel 2 and 1, issue number one. What a great comic. So much fun. Self-contained. Introduces us to who the man thing is. It's a nice thing adventure as well. Benjamin J. Grimm's character is spot on. The story's got a nice flow to it. Molecule Man's son was a cool villain. A nice one and done villain. But it was easy peasy, beautiful color girl. I really, really liked this. So kudos to everybody. The Vengeance of the Molecule Man. This absolutely works for me. And I did notice that there was a stand soapbox. So whenever there's a stand soapbox, if I feel like we have time and we got a couple minutes before we got, let's just read it real quick. Notice anything different about your latest Marvel mags? Notice more space devoted to the bullpen bulletins? How about the larger letters page? And the fact that we have fewer titles on sale than a few months ago? Yea, verily, listen to the voice of Marveldom assembled to the cry of far-flung foamdom, all shouting why, why, why? And since you asked, during this past year, as most of you have noticed, the spreading of fame and growth of Marvel have been almost unbelievable. We've outsold every other comic book publisher in America and throughout the world. But more titles we gave you, the more you kept demanding. And the more you asked for, the more we tried to give you. Until just a short time ago, we realized we had to stop and catch our breath. For in our never-ending effort to satisfy the greatest, most loyal legion of fans anyone ever had, we were in danger of sacrificing quality for quantity. And we're just not about to do that. Now, I want to stop there and just comment on that real quick. How many times have we said too many comics, too many crossovers, too many tie-ins, too many just number ones every single week? Give us good, solid runs. Give us something like this. Give us Marvel 2-in-1. Let it go for 100 issues. Give us something. Point being, Marvel, listen to your fans. Listen to your fans. You did back then, and you had a nice era. This was a good era for, for Marvel. Historically, I think the 70s were... It was a different time. Things were shifting. There's a new generation of, of writers and artists coming in, kind of changing things up. Code, uh, the comics code is loosening up a little bit, so you're able to play with ideas like the man thing, Tomb of Dracula, stuff like that. And it's a nice period that I want to dive more into. So let me know. Marvel 2-in-1 number 2. Are we doing it? Are you interested? Do you want to see it? And also, do you want to see Marvel comics from the 70s? Do you want to see more stuff like this? Let me know. Thank you so much for checking out the video. I've been rocking Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading. Station. All right, so that's that video. I hope you liked it. I enjoyed watching it along with y'all and seeing the comments and all that stuff. So, hell yeah. Pretty interesting story. Thanks, Robbie. Hell yeah. That was a great issue. Hell yeah, Bob. Bobby's got every single run. He's got the whole issue. He's got every single issue of the whole run. I uh, I have one, two, three, four. I think five's the first one I got to get. I got six and seven. But uh, like, I got a lot of them, but not all of them. So if anybody knows, if anybody's got extras, if anybody knows where I can get them for cheap, just let me know, y'all, because that's what we're doing. All right, it's time for show and tell. So this is a Ghostbusters themed show and tell. It's going to have some stuff that I already had and it's going to have some stuff that I just got. <clears throat> Courtesy of Mike the Voice Matthews and our good buddy Sam. So Sam Station, love you. Good to always see you and chat with you at the shop. So one of the best things, first of all, first of all, the fucking worst thing about the most recent Ghostbusters movies afterlife and frozen empire is that none of them have been uh, coupled with the cross promotion with high C to do ecto cooler again what the f fuck is wrong with y'all if you really want us to get excited i'll tell you this i will goddamn guarantee you this if you got us to know that every time there was a Ghostbusters movie, that for a few months that year, we would have Ecto Cooler, we wouldn't make every Ghostbusters movie a fucking success. So even if you don't care about making good movies, just fucking put out the Ecto Cooler tie-in. Please, please. If you, I'm sorry, I'm so fucking pissed. But if you fucking make a Ghostbusters movie and... You put out Ecto Cooler that year, you're going to raise your ticket sales. I am not even fucking kidding. I'm not even kidding. And don't do that bullshit where it's like an AMC exclusive or some shit like that. When I watched Ghostbusters today, I switched up. 
my whole thing. There's a new Fanta orange flavor in the States. Fanta orange, by the way, in the fucking rest of the world, fucking rocks. And so I tested it, but I tested the zero sugar version because I also got a pack of gummy bears. So that was my, my, my Ghostbusters snack today. Uh, I like sharing this, the, these details. I should have shared this earlier, but like I, I had ghost, I had some, uh, for Ghostbusters, I had some gummy bears, Arboro gummy bears, a uh, pack of them. And I devoured them very, I, I made it through half the fucking movie on the gummy bears. So that's good. Um, and also I had a, a nice like zero sugar Fanta with the new flavor. It was good. It was fine for a zero sugar Fanta, but nothing is like the European Fanta. We have a European market here. Why do I not stock that in my goddamn fridge? I need to. All right. Anyway, this is a Ghostbusters themed uh, show and tell. One of the things I do like about the uh, Ghostbusters tie-ins is when they do these Kenner classic reissues. So for Afterlife, they did the original um, uh, line of Ghostbusters toys. Now, the real Ghostbusters, the the... I love that animated series. I love those movies. I mean, this is my childhood. So I, I, of course I got them. And I've thought about selling these things many times, but I never have. And I've never taken them off the card. They look so good on the card. But I tell you what, I think I'm going to unbox these when I finally get the firehouse. When I get an old school classic fucking firehouse complete, and that's a dope thing. One of the things in the new movie is that they have to, they, they finally deal with the idea, excuse me, <laughs> they finally deal with the idea that the Ghostbusters containment unit, unit is, is, God, is going to overload, right? And when they design a new one, it looks like the toy version, which fucking cracks me up, and I love it. I want the firehouse from the Ghostbusters complete so bad. We had one at my shop years ago and it was so it was only a hundred dollars then and i could have gotten it but my girlfriend at the time when when i knew she wouldn't be happy with that she's no longer in my life i should have gotten that fucking anyway i should have gotten that goddamn thing anyway there's the stay puff marshmallow man this these are the kenner reissues i love having them on card i've thought about selling them but I'm glad I didn't sell them because after watching the show, the, the movie today, I really wanted to bring these out and look at them. So there's my Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Yeah, that's my new goal. When I get the firehouse, I'll tell you what. It's 324. All super chats from 324 until we're done. Go to fund the Ghostbusters Vintage Firehouse complete playset, and then i'll open all of these we'll do a whole event out of it but there's what they called at the time green ghost that's slimer who's in this movie but he's got like a, a pizza a steak and a watermelon there's a really nice bit with slimer and a pizza in the new movie that i really did like all right here's peter vankman the original Ghostbuster. Once again, these are the Kenner Classic reissues. These came out during Afterlife. But fuck it, we're going to open them when we get the firehouse. I'm going to hold on to them. We're going to open them when we get the firehouse. We're going to have a whole display back there of the Ghostbusters firehouse and all of these figures. Every Super Chat will now go to that, 100%. All right. That was Peter. Here is Winston. Now, I had these figures when I was a kid. Lost all the ghosts. Lost the proton packs eventually. Lost the figures. Yeah, let's fucking... Let's get that firehouse and open up. Just like we did the Joker van. Just like we did the Toxic Crusader. That's our new fucking goal right there. Fuck the Blu-ray shelves. That's what we need. There's Ray. Who here is a fan of the original... Ghostbusters cartoon, the real Ghostbusters, as well as the movie. I love. They come with the uh, proton packs and the... I've had these for years since Afterlife came out. And there's Egon right there. 
They all have a unique ghost. They all have a different color uh, energy proton stream from the proton pack. But thanks to Mike and to Sam, this year they re-released the Fright Features. These were some of my favorite Ghostbuster toys when I was a kid because they all had this effect where you would squeeze their legs and they would have this like cartoonish fright feature. So there's Peter Venkman right there. I think you can get these at like your Walmarts and shit right now. But we just got these because of Mike and Sam. There's Winston. I had these when I was a kid. They all come with a different weapon and a different ghost. So it's really cool. You can build up your like little ghost collection by buying all of these figures. Some of my favorite Ghostbuster figures are the fright features, <clears throat> excuse me, and the humans that would turn to monsters, right? Like I would love to get all of those again. I wish they would redo those. There's Egon. I love that when his tie flips up. Uh -huh. And here's Ray. You know, for a long time, these were my Ghostbuster figures, were the, the fright features. Like, I had the originals when I was a kid. I had Winston, and I had Ray and Egon, but I never had Peter, right? And it always bothered me. But then on the fright features, I had all four of them. And it felt to me like that was my Ghostbuster team. But on top of that, I never had this as a kid. They reissued this for Afterlife. I've never opened it. That's the Ecto-1 remastered kenner classics right there oh my goodness y'all what is the firehouse at right now firehouse subs no let's just go to ebay we'll go to ebay we'll see what the firehouse is is going for right now uh vintage ghostbusters I want that playset. It's the one thing. 284. That's complete. 95% complete. 175. 200. 230. Fuck. 300. All right, y'all. I think 200 bucks, we get it. All right, tonight we had $15 in Super Chats of 200 Ghostbusters Firehouse. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and be like, what's GBFF or FH mean? Um, that's our next fucking PCP goal. I don't give a shit about anything else. Fuck the utilities. Fuck the rent. We're getting the Ghostbusters fucking playhouse so we can open all these up and have the Ghostbusters display, goddammit. That's what we're doing. And more vintage figures, please, from 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 people. Kenner, especially. That would be redo the Dark Knight collection. That would be so dope. Like, don't just do the superpower shit that Todd McFarlane's doing, where they're different enough where it doesn't appease a superpowers fan. There's my superpowers figures right there. Um, fuck yeah. Every super chat from this point until we're done. And we still got 185 to go. We're getting that Ghostbusters fucking firehouse. Fuck yeah, let's do it. All right. That was a uh, show and tell. And now it's time for your official. <gasps> Final five. All right, we're going through these Joe Jusco Marvel Masterpieces uh, figures or <laughs> cards. My bad. There's Dr. Doom card number 26. That's badass. Look at the fucking dynamic perspective on that. Look at that background. Maybe it's too much on here. Could have been more in the background. Like, if you would have given us this expanded, that'd be really fucking dope. All right. After Dr. Doom, we have Dormammu right there. It's very similar to the Doctor Strange. In fact, it makes a good comparison to that. Let's, uh, let's break that shit out. Oh, yeah. Those actually work really well together. Don't they? It's dope as shit. Dormammu, right there. Come to bargain. Next up, Deathlock. 
Now, this is uh, the Michael Collins Deathlock, which it says his first appearance is the limited series from 1990. Yeah, 1990, so he's a rookie. But there's Deathlock. I'm not going to lie. I'm not necessarily the hugest fan of this character. This is a really dope card. Gambit. That's dope as shit, actually. Gambit's very new. He's a rookie at this time. And then, so awesome that this card needs to be bigger to really fully appreciate it. Galactus, Marvel Masterpieces, Joe Jusco. All right, so my favorite on the last was Dr. Doc Ock. He's definitely getting beat here. Oh, this is tough as fuck. Honestly, the composition of the Doctor Doom could be better. Honestly, that... I'm not going to lie... For tonight, my favorite Marvel masterpieces is this fucking Gambit. Like, there's something about that that is striking as fuck to me. I really like that. I like that a lot. That's my favorite tonight. It goes against uh, Black Panther and Captain America from the previous weeks. And we'll see what the uh, final winner is. But uh, hell yeah. And we got Choco's 20. All right, with a $5 super chat. 180 to go on the uh, firehouse. That That's being generous, but yeah, 180. Fuck yeah. Dude, I love you so much. Thank you so much. You're the best, Chocos. This one's for you. Damn, we are 175 away from the firehouse. We are going to make that happen, PCP Army. That fucking Joker van right there. That happened by y'all. I I have that because of y'all. That we all own that. You know what I'm saying? And every anytime anybody comes into town, you come to studio, you get to touch it. That's how it works. But that sounded fucking weird. All right. Uh, also, uh, we got a Toxic Crusader figure. It's, he's not uh, in here right now. Bourbon streams are where the magic happens. I'm out of bourbon. I want to keep fucking going. I want to keep fucking going. I want to keep going. I want to keep going. And here's the thing. Here's the fucking thing. Are we going four hours tonight? Let's do four hours tonight. Here's how we do it. Here's how we fucking do it. Right now, we're 175 away from the fucking Ghostbusters firehouse. I'm going to go refill my drink. When I get back, I want to see a $5 super chat. Y'all get the next sneak peek of a top-down video. It's a Marvel comic from 1984. Trust me, y'all want to see that. Five more dollars. Can we get us to 170 tonight? Let me go get some more fucking drink. We're taking a quick break. We'll be right back here on Rockin' Robbie Live Bourbon Stream.
Everybody's talking all this stuff about me. Why won't they just let me live? I don't need permission, make my own decisions. That's my prerogative. They say I'm crazy, I really don't care. That's my prerogative. They say I'm nasty, but I don't give a damn. Getting girls is how I live. Some ask me questions. Why am I so rare? They don't really understand me. I really know what's the deal about a brother. Trying hard to make it right. Not long ago. Before I win this fight, say everybody's talking all this stuff about me. Why won't they just let me live? Tell me why I don't need permission. Make my own decisions. That's my prerogative. It's my prerogative. It's the way that I want to live. It's my prerogative. I can do just what on I feel. It's my prerogative. No one can tell me what to do. It's my prerogative. Cause I'm doing, I'm doing for you now. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. Not yet. That part, not, not, not yet, Robbie. This, where, where am I at? Cause what I'm doing. I'm doing for you, don't get me wrong, I'm not really soup to ego trips, it's not my thing, all these strange relationships really get me down, no I'm fucking that up, I see nothing wrong. We're spreading myself around now. Everybody's talking all this stuff about me. Why won't they just let me live? I don't need permission. Make my own decisions. It's my prerogative. It's my prerogative. It's the way that I want to live. It's my prerogative. I can... I can live my life, it's my prerogative. I'm doing it just for you, it's my prerogative. This is the part where I need y'all's help. Y'all ready? Tell me, tell me why can't I live my life without all of the things people say? Hey, hey. Oh, everybody's talking all this stuff about me. Why won't they just let me live? Tell me why I don't need permission. Make my own decisions. That's my prerogative. Come on, everybody. Everybody's talking all this stuff about me. Why won't they just let me Tell me why I don't need permission. Make my own decision. That's my prerogative. It's my prerogative. Fuck it. That was fucking dope, everybody. That was fucking dope is what that was. How about that? That was fucking dope. I don't give a shit. That was fucking dope. I am bourboned out. I hope you're happy, Eric. I'm fucking bourboned out. This is good as shit. Bobby fucking Brown. I got to sing another song. What's the song I'm doing? I want to do another. Well, that's the one Godsmack song. Oh, I know what I'm doing. Another thing that came up in my Spotify recently that I've been diving back into is I'm not even giving a shit. That first Creed album, My Own Prison, is fucking dope. So I'm going to do Torn. How about that? Chocos. You did another super chat. You hit us. You hit us, bro. We got once 170 to fucking go. We're going to make this firehouse fucking happen. It's fucking dope. Chocos is the MVP tonight, y'all. You're getting that Shelly Duvall review very soon after March Madness. I overloaded, but things are ironing out. We'll get it back together. Tell me why can't I live my life? 
without all of the things people say. Fuck yes. Jesus Christ. All right. <laughs> so back in 1998, I, for the first time, had a five disc player, a five disc CD player in my bedroom. I bought it at Walmart. My first job at the grocery store of my first fucking paycheck. I went and bought this sweet ass five speaker system, <laughs> two cassette decks, five CDs, a five CD changer, a microphone input, five speakers. You could hook it up through auxiliary cables to your VCR. I remember watching Blade on VHS with it. This very fucking copy right here. Tell me why my performances are better when I don't have to look at the lyrics. That very copy of Blade I watched on that fucking five disc goddamn CD changer, five speaker set. So it blew me away, y'all, that I could set any of those CDs on any track or actually it was the first track to wake me up. So in 1998, I was either woken up by Rammstein's Zane Zucht, <laughs> track one, or Godzilla, the motion picture soundtrack, track one, or Creed, my own prison, track one, for the most part. And Creed, track one, is torn. Tell me why can't I live my life without all of the things People say, they say I'm nasty, but I don't give a damn. Getting girls is how I live. Yeah, it's way better when I don't have to look at the lyrics. I, I, I trip myself up too much. All right. I love y'all so much. <laughs> now y'all know I love karaoke so much. Station. Fuck, we ain't done four hours in a minute. This is we're going to do it, though. So, Torn is a great song to wake up to by Creed. I'm not giving a shit. I'm sorry. I think Creed sucks for the most part post their first album, but, like, maybe some songs in that second. What if? What if? What if? Only because it's, a tie, it's tied to, like, Scream 3 or some shit. But anyway. What if I die? Um... We're doing Creed, and this is a good song to wake up to. It kind of gets you going. Because it starts out. I mean, shout out if you like Creed back in the day. I want to see it. Karaoke vid? Yeah, you want to see one? We'll do it next time. And this is says, Bourbon Robbie is fucking amazing. Well, all right, I feel really good. How I feel in the morning, we'll see. I'll, I'll keep you updated. I'll take a selfie in the morning. I'll probably feel great, actually, to be honest. So then, this is a long song, but then Scott Stapp, I, I know, he's a douchebag. But anyway, P, how's it going? P, is what they tell me. Love, am I unholy? <clears throat> I like this. Lies, yeah. What would they tell me? Despite. You that control me The peace is dead in my soul I have blamed the reasons for my intentions Poor Yeah, I'm the one who The only one who Will carry on 
on this fire. <laughs> I'm filthy. Born in my own misery. All right, all right. Stole all that you gave me. The guitar is like do 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 control oh, oh. you claim you save me the peace is dead in my soul I have blamed the reasons for my intentions but yeah, I'm the one who, the only one who will carry on this flower. Peace in my hand. And he's like, love in my head. One of my favorite parts. Lies, lies, lies in my head. The peace is dead in my soul. I have blamed the reason for my intentions. Oh. Yeah, I'm the one who, the only one who would carry on this fire. Peace is dead in my soul. I have blamed the reasons for my intentions. Poor. Yeah, I'm the one who, the only one who would carry on this fire. Peace in my head. Fuck yeah, that was so much fun. I want to keep going. I want to keep going. <laughs> What's the song? Somebody request a song. Somebody request a song. Any animated movie or TV recommendations, new or old? I feel like the original one. Batman, the animated series, if you never watched it, is the best. Outside of that, Spectacular Spider-Man is the best Spider-Man series ever. Spectacular Spider-Man. WB, like, mid-2000s or something like that. Check that out. Fuck, I'm hyped right now. Yeah, I heard about the kayfabe fucking drama. We'll fucking see how that develops this week. Shit. We lost 30 viewers when I started seeing Creed. Your breathing technique is great. Well, thank you. I used to rap. Maybe that's a part of it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's a really good comment. That's great. Robbie's my karaoke partner. Hell yeah. No, I don't know any typo. I've listened to him. I don't know him enough. Some Matchbox 20. I did push not too long ago. What else could I do? Do I know 3AM enough? Yeah, I don't know. She said it's cold outside and she hands me my raincoat. She says she's always worried about things like that. No, I, I can't do I can't do Matchbox 20 right now. I'm sorry. Maybe Ben. Can you help me? I'm Ben. I'm so scared that I'll never get put back together. Keep breaking me in. And this is how we will end with you and me, band. But I don't know the rest of it. Frank Sinatra, fuck. Some three doors down. Fuck, you done fucked up, man. 
You done fucked up, man. <laughs> you done fucked up, man. That's what we're going to be. What about that one STP song? What about STP? In my head. What can I come up with right now? I am, I am, my head. I said I want to get next to you. I said I want to get close to you. You wouldn't want me to have to hurt you too. Hurt you too. I know you want what's on my mind. I know you like what's on my mind. I know it eats you up inside. I know you know, you know, you know. There's a, another one I really love. is a, What's the Interstate Love Song? How does that go? I love, I love, oh shit. Uh, let's fix that. I love STP. Interstate Love Song. Nope. See, I get these songs in my head and then I can't fucking think of these. Interstate love song. Waiting on a Sunday afternoon for what I've read between the lines. Your lies. Feeling like a hand in rusted chain. So do you laugh or does it cry? Reply, leaving on southern train only yesterday. You lied. Promises of what I seem to be Only once the time Go by All of these things you said to me I ain't doing Creed higher Fuck out of here <laughs> Oh, I, you feel like I could cover Incubus? <clears throat> Pardon me while I'm a decade ago, I never thought I would be at 23 on the verge of spontaneous combustion. Woe is me, but I guess I can pan. But I mean, I mean, ah, fuck that up. I did fuck it up. Hold on, let me look at the lyrics. Y'all know I was trying. Pardon me while I burst into flame. <clears throat> A decade ago, I never thought I would be a 23 on the verge of spontaneous combustion. Woe was me. But I guess that it comes with a territory, an ominous old landscape of a never ending calamity. I need you to hear, I need you to see that I have had all I can take in exploding. Seems like an definite possibility to me. So pardon me while I burst into flames. I've had enough of the world and this people's mindless games. So pardon me while I burn and rise above the flames. Pardon me, pardon me. I'll never be the same. Not two days ago, I was having a look in a book and I saw a picture of a guy fried up above his knees. And I guess I can think, cause lately I've been thinking of combustication as a recommendation from the planet ends of the planet Earth. Like gravity, hypocrisy, and the perils of living in 3D. But thinking so much differently. So pardon me while I burst 
into flames I've had enough of the world and it's people's mindless games so pardon me while I'm burned and rise above the flames pardon me pardon me don't ever be the same Never be the same. I fucked up that whole second fucking verse. I feel really bad. Tupac. <laughs> how about this one? This is how we're going to end it. All right, here we go. <clears throat> well, I took a walk around the world to ease my troubled mind. I left my body lying somewhere in the sands of time. I walked the world up to the dark side of the moon. I feel there's nothing I can do. Yeah, yeah. I watched the world flow through the dark side of the moon. After all, I knew it had to be something to do with you. I really don't mind what happens now and then. As long as you'll be my friend at the end. Yeah. If I go crazy, then will you still call me Superman? If I'm alive, then will you, you be there holding my hand? I'll keep you by my side with my future human mind. Kryptonite. Yeah. Do 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 Saw these guys live like two or three times. I can't remember. You call me strong, you call me weak, but still your secrets I will keep. You took for granted all the times I never let you down. You stumbled in and bumped your head. If not for you, then you'd be dead. You picked me up. I picked you up and put you back on solid ground, yeah. If I go crazy, then will you still call me Superman? If I'm alive, and well, will you be there holding my hand? I'll keep you by my side with my superhuman might, kryptonite, yeah! <laughs> If I go crazy, then will you still call me Superman? If I'm alive and well, will you be there holding my hand? I'll keep you by my side with my superhuman might. Kryptonite. Yeah! If I go crazy, then will you still call me Superman? If I'm alive and well, will you be there a holding my hand? I'll keep you by my side with my superhuman might. Kryptonite. Yeah! I think I'm going to karaoke that one very, very soon. That's what I'm thinking. Roland, Limp Biscuit. I'll do a Limp Biscuit song. What's the one I should do? Limp Biscuit. <clears throat> I just do what I can remember right now. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. Three Dollar Bill, y'all, still a dope ass album. But we're moving to another song. 
psycho female blowing up the phone lines you need to tighten that screw it's been loose for a long time i've been slammed with some bad bad luck soon i'm gonna bring you doom with the buck buck i, I don't remember it i'm sorry <laughs> psycho. okay that's stuck stuck on yourself you <sighs> You take a blast from our past that you ask that I'm blasting your bad luck. You so stuck. What's counterfeit? You're freaking me out, you wear a mask. Freak me. Oh, yeah. Hey, man, wake up and smell the concrete. Strange to see you change like the LB. Could be uh, the identity crisis. You feel like bite this. Three LD bites, but that's what life is. Pitiful you. Yeah, I need to get back here. I haven't listened to it enough. Sorry. Can't do that one. Robbie definitely inspires it. Well, thank you. <laughs> If I go crazy, then will you still call me Superman? Freebird? Freebird, man. I think I've done it before. And I don't want to be greedy and ask for another fucking super chat. But if I do Freebird, that's like a fucking ambition. Okay? But fuck it, let's do it. Get your lighters ready. Because I live in Alabama, and there's a part of me that is stone-cold Skinner. And there's a part of me that's very much like, no, <laughs> but trust me. Uh, try not to cry. This was one of my mother's favorite bands. So whenever I see Skinner, whenever I sing Skinner, I can get emotional, and I've been drinking the bourbon. Let's see what happens. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hold on. You know what? Let's just go ahead and do the sneak peek first, and then I got to get ready for this, honestly, because, like, I, I, like, I love you too. No, I'm going to fucking do it. I'm going to fucking do it. I'm going to do Freebird. But let me get this set up. Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're gonna take a look inside Marvel 2-in-1. Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie. All right. Sneak peek. I covered Transformers number one from 1984. Where the fuck is Fable? We're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do Freebird. I gotta emotionally prepare for this. <laughs> If I leave here tomorrow. Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're taking a look inside Transformers number one from Marvel Comics in 1984. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're diving into Transformers number one from Marvel Comics. Now, I don't have the original comic book, but I do have this reprint of issues one, two, and three that was published by Marvel Books. Think of it as an early form of a trade paperback, a collected edition, graphic novel, something like that, right? Now, it does not contain the original covers. It does not contain chapter breaks. Heck, it doesn't even have uh, the creators listed on the book, and it does not include that amazing first issue cover by Bill Sienkiewicz. Now, I would like to get a copy of the original one because, honestly, the reprint on this it leaves a lot to be desired. It's nice that it's in a bigger size, a bigger format. It's cool that this exists. I was able to pick this up very cheaply, but mine's kind of falling apart. There are bits that are literally hanging on by a thread, and it doesn't quite deliver the colors in the way that I would like them to be delivered, but at the same time, I also don't even know if the colors are that good on the originals, because I've never read this book. Now, I'm a huge Transformers fan. I grew up loving the cartoon, grew up enjoying the action figures, what what little I could get. In fact, most of the time I had GoBots. Like, my, my grandparents would give me GoBots because they would think, hey, this is a Transformer, right? Um, but I'm really excited to dive into this because 
since the Energon universe started, Daniel Warren Johnson started doing stuff with Transformers. It has reignited, re-energized, some could say, my whole vibe with Transformers, right? I've been maintaining my my action figure collection a little bit more. I buy more of the modern figures, not really a lot of the, the vintage stuff for me. But I wanted to dive into this and check it out. I do love this idea that they did reprint it. You know, this was a very huge selling comic. I think the first issue went through three printings. And then of course this, which has one, two, and three. I don't know if they did any more outside of this. It's got a new cover, which is very rad. It's very radical, very 80s, very airbrushy, chromey. I don't know, there's something about it that's really cool. Like if this was like a poster, I would totally want to frame this and put this up somewhere in my house. It is a little overdone. It is a little overwrought, but I had fun with it. Um, so basic backstory on Transformers. Hasbro had approached Marvel Comics to do a G.I. Joe comic to promote the toy line. It was a huge resounding success. So two years later, they come in with the same approach towards Transformers. Now, editor-in-chief at the time, Jim Shooter, came up with a basic idea that there would be two warring mechanical alien factions from another planet called Cybertron that would be stranded on Earth, and it would be about... That. That's what the story is going to be. Now, <clears throat> all of these characters have profiles written by writer Bud, or my bad, Bob Budiansky, right? Now, he would eventually come on as the writer of this series, but the first four issues have a few different writers, right? First of all, it is plotted by Bill Mantlo, and it is scripted by Ralph Macchio. It's got artwork by Frank Springer, and uh, of course, that will change over time as well. This has become known as a big deal as far as what it did to develop Transformers lore and mythology. <clears throat> so yeah, let's do it. Let's dive right into the story begins, issue number one of Transformers. Now, I guess at this time they hadn't really nailed um, what the story was. This is, I don't, I don't know the timing of the animated series with this comic book, but I'm assuming that the comic book was before the animated series. In fact, Springer didn't even have full like representations of the characters to work from, so a lot of it looks a little wonky. Some of the stuff doesn't quite fit, but a lot of it is still that core root of what we know as Transformers. All right, so it starts off by telling us that there's a whole planet out there that orbits Alpha Centauri. It's called Cybertron, and it is all mechanical life. Everything is entirely mechanical. It introduces this high civilization there where they're the Autobots, and they live in peace and they live in joy. But there is a faction led by a dude named Megatron that call themselves the Decepticons, and they just want to tear shit up. For no other reason than I guess they just want to. They're following Megatron. I say, but every paradise has its serpent. And on this world, it was Megatron, commander of those who call themselves the Decepticons. And then Ravage is talking. I didn't even know Ravage talked. Am I misremembering? Am I misremembering the cartoon? Did Ravage talk in the cartoon? I don't remember that, but Ravage is talking. Look at them below, contented, fools ripe for our conquest. Indeed, Ravage, we have lived peacefully with the Autobots for eons, slowly, secretly gathering our strength and pursuing our technology. Now we shall strike at those who have brought the stagnation of peace and plenty to Cybertron. So I guess Megatron's idea is that this society has become stagnant. This society has no conflict, so everything is so easy that nobody actually strives for something. Of course, I think he just wants to dominate and rule. You see a little bit of a different look on Megatron here. There's Soundwave, there's Ravage. A little bit of screen tone here. The coloring on this is way off. Now, I have never seen the inside of a Transformers number one from 1984, but it is, oh, like the color is so weird. I don't know if the color's redone here. I don't know if it's just because of the paper. I don't know if it's just haphazardly put together, but there's a lot of like, I don't know what's the term, but where it's like, it's over the line. So it's just a big blotch of color right there, but it, it doesn't, it's not clearly in the line. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because this is meant to soak in that newsprint paper, but on here, it it's not that the colors or the choices come across as too gaudy or anything. It's just 
There's a lot of like overflow on the lines and it just doesn't quite work. So anyway, Megatron and his people, they attack the Autobots. It throws Cybertron out of orbit. So now Cybertron is flying, flinging across the uh, the galaxy and has been knocked out of orbit because of the sincerity, the, or I should say the severity of this war. And in the midst of this rises a hero. Like even from page to page, that Megatron... Looks different than that Megatron, just a little bit, but I love the screen tone in the eyes. I like that effect. But then they introduce that from the greatest of city states, there came a leader to inspire the Autobots at the hour of their deadliest peril. That's Optimus Prime. We get introduced to him. He's got a combat mode. He can transform into a combat vehicle whose powers rival even Megatron's. There's more of this giant fighting. A lot of just generic looking Transformers. Interesting screen tone. One thing about this printing is the line work prints really well. And the screen tone is very, very clear. Here's some more of that coloring. We're just getting the splotch of the yellow kind of over. Now a newsprint, that would kind of sink in. And I think that this would be a much better panel with the way that that yellow would fade in and that screen tone right there. But alas, this is just the way it is. Um, I think we got our first view of Bumblebee right there from behind. The planet is heading towards an asteroid belt, so they need to send a segment of Autobots out there to clear this asteroid belt. Optimus Prime says he's going to take some of his people to go and clear this in their own ship called the Ark, and um, Megatron hears about it, right? Megatron hears about it because Ravage, of course, is a big spy. Kind of like, it. once again, there's a lot of core elements to these characters and to the story that is present here even though if it is a little bit shaky a little bit like they don't know what to do but this is something that happens with licensed comics very often i remember when i was going through all the gold key star trek books on my own you know and to to learn that the artists didn't know anything about the show they'd never seen the show they didn't know anything about the characters they kind of just did it on their own and went with it for instance there's castle decepticon that's home to megatron he finds out they decide they're going to take a ship and go after these autobots on this mission and after they clear the asteroid belt then they're going to attack them that's exactly what they do here nothing really to write home about with the art there are moments where it's cool, but it's just very inconsistent. It's kind of all over the place. I guess there's some decent inking. I don't know about the coloring, really, the way it's printing on this. It's just not quite working for me. But a big battle ensues, all kinds of chaos. So it gets right to it. And, you know, in the comic book, I mean, in the or in the new comic book, as well as in the original animated show, They Awaken on Earth, we don't find out so much about the past of it until way later, right, if at all. So they're this big battle. They decide because now they're close to Earth. And they're, they, they, they scan it and it seems like Earth is uninhabited. So Optimus takes the Autobots on a suicide mission, is going to ram the Ark into Earth. Um, and hopefully the Decepticons follow, I guess, because they're not... Well, they, they are on the Ark, yes. Yeah, so they're on the Ark and he's going to crash it, kamikaze it, into this mountain. There it lays for four million years until a volcano erupts and awakens the Ark. And as the Ark awakens, like in the uh, new series and like in the animated series, um, the robot, now it's not referenced as Teletron 1 here, but the, the Ark wakes up and sends out a scanner. The scanner can't read organic life, so it thinks that all these like planes and vehicles are sentient Earth life. So then it takes the Decepticons and the Autobots because it doesn't understand the difference. It explains that the memory banks have been damaged in the crash. So it doesn't know the difference between Decepticons and Autobots. But it basically sets them up with these alt modes so that they can blend into the Earth life. Or at least what this machine thinks is Earth life. Of course, we know it's just vehicles and stuff. But the Autobots... They are going to resemble earthly weapons and communication vehicles, and the Autobots are going to be, uh, or communication devices and earthly weapons for the Decepticons, and the Autobots, of course, will be Earth vehicles. They awaken right next to each other. Very quickly, they kind of take their own way. They, like, kind of split off, and here, lots of words. 
The writing in this is not very good. I mean, it gets a lot of information across, but it does so in a very clunky way. Like we have to take the time for every single Decepticon to mention who they are, what their significant power is. But we got Skywarp, Thundercracker, Starscream. We got Rumble and Frenzy, Soundwave, Laserbeak and Buzzsaw and Ravage. And there's Megatron right there. They decide that they are going to try to dominate this earth, right? And, and destroy the Autobots yet again. That's their plan. Then we see Ratchet and Optimus right there and we're introduced in a similar fashion to all of the Autobots, including Ironhide and that really doofy original version of Ironhide. You can tell that they got maybe some toy designs, but not everybody and it just kind of goes a little wonky. But we got Huffer, we've got Bumblebee, we've got Sunstreaker, we got Sideswipe right there, Brawn right there, Cliff Jumper, there's Optimus, and then a whole bunch more. <laughs> a bunch of just overly verbose explaining, but this is introducing us to the characters. Now, I talked about in Daniel Warren Johnson's Transformers book how I like that He's focusing in on just a few characters at first instead of just throwing everything at you. It kind of makes it feel like a more organic start to the story and a more uh, natural introduction to all the characters. But here already we got a bunch more Mirage, Blue Streak, Prowl, Jazz, Gears, Hound, Wind Charger, Ratchet, uh, Wheeljack, and Trailbreaker. And then they're just talking like, yo, let's take a look at the life on this Earth. They see all these vehicles. They think that, you know, that's life on Earth. So they send a hound and a team out to do a little bit of recon work and find out a little bit more about this, this world that they're on. Then we get introduced to this dude who's like just hiking near this volcano and he sees these Autobots streaking right across. So there we see them in their, in their alt vehicle forms doing all their stuff. You know, Cliff Junker, Jumper's talking a little bit of shit with everybody. It's, it's kind of interesting. The personalities are starting to already be clearly defined in some of these Transformers. So they go and find a bunch of vehicles. It's actually a drive-in. They think it's some kind of like religious ceremony with all these like, you know, uh, vehicles, which they think are life at this point. Uh, they think that they're just like worshiping the screen or something. But then Laserbeak is spotting them. And now Laserbeak giving this information to Megatron. Megatron is assuming and, dis and thinking that the Autobots are making uh, a pact with the denizens of Earth. These mechanical den denizens of Earth. Meanwhile, they're coming. So here come the Autobots into this drive through This is a nice little bit where this woman's like, all right, how many? Well, well, come on, come on. You pay by the head, you know. So I guess they get in for free because nobody's driving these vehicles. She doesn't think too much of it. This dude is making out with his girlfriend. There's a random dude in the back seat. He's like, hey, Buster, Jesse, could you two disengage so I can see this movie? Oh, sorry. So they're making out. This dude can't see. I guess that's their buddy. So this is Buster Witwicky. It's not Spike. Now, I believe that I've heard watching Michael Mercy's, he does these great History of Transformer uh, toy videos. I believe that Buster is later revealed to be Spike's brother and that Spike eventually comes in. But right now, the focus is on Buster. And while they're having this interaction, there's a, there's a crash that happens and Bumblebee has crashed into this vehicle of theirs and there's nobody in there. So he doesn't know what's going on. Meanwhile, the Decepticons attack all these people start freaking out. The Autobots decide to transform and to fight back. And the humans are just like, what in the hell is going on? Now, the Autobots are like, why are these, these beings not defending themselves? And they eventually put together that these strange little things are the sentient life on Earth. And these mechanical objects are actually not life at all. And it's something they have to wrap their head around. But <clears throat> even right here, you know, for instance, I told Megatron this frontal assault tactic he's so fond of is foolish, Thundercracker. Guile and stealth are far more effective than missiles in the long run. We have to follow Megatron's way, Starscream. It's been successful up to now. I don't think we should openly defy him as you've been known to do. So once again, we're getting that dynamic, that the, the even the inner conflict amongst the Decepticons, the idea is that Starscream is always questioning Megatron. Maybe he feels like he's got better ideas, stuff like that, right? So you get this battle, it's all happening. Cliff Jumper has a glass gas gun, which when he fires it, the gas coats me, making my metal brittle and breakable as glass. That's a weird stretch. They're breaking apart. They start to go away, but Ravage is there. Him and Hound have a little bit of a confrontation. Uh, there's Soundwave, who looks like he's miscolored right there. 
and just some more, you know, this is the moment where they realize that these are people and these are just vehicles and not sentient life. So then they transform back. They're running around. Meanwhile, Buster is trying to figure out what's going on with this, this, this yellow bug, Volkswagen bug that he's finding. He gets inside. There's no ignition, no key, no gas pedal, and it starts driving by itself. And then he's like, wait, did these things just turn from robots into cars? Bumblebee drives and whisks him away. They wind up, he's guiding them through the steering wheel, winds up going home to his dad's spark plug, right? Spark plug at the house next to it has a garage. He's been trying to figure out what's wrong with this car or how it can self-drive, what's going on. Spark plug's like, oh, I love this. After all my years of trying to get you to put down the poetry and pick up a monkey wrench, it looks like you finally took your old dad's advice, fixing cars on the side, are you? Dad, I can explain. No need to explain, son. My shop's your shop. Use it any time you want. But just to let you know, son, I'm proud of you. But then, all of a sudden, they hear a whimpering voice from Bumblebee. This thing's alive. And he says, help me, please. I'm dying. Next. Hey, buddy, can you spare me some fuel? And that's it. Now we go immediately into the second issue. But we'll dive into that at another time. I do not have the second issue. Um in physical format except for here so we'll have to go through here but what do you want to see do you want to see me go into transformers number two and then from three on i have the original issues and we can talk a little bit more about the coloring about the printing of it and and just i want to see this world it's interesting i i enjoyed i enjoyed it i didn't necessarily i knew going into it that this was a cheap easy way to go ahead and get one and two which i don't have and I, I could get, I have really low grade copies of three, four, five, six, seven, and onward. But <clears throat> I wanted to, to be able to have a one and two to be able to start this revisit or this visit for the first time because I've never read this stuff. I'm intrigued. I want to keep going. Do you guys want to see issue two? Let me know. Were you there for Transformers number one? What's your recollection? Let me know. Overall, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed seeing the early starts to the lore and the mythology of Transformers, right? Let me liken it to this. So when I got into Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I sporadically watched it throughout season two, but it was season three where I really locked in and became a huge Buffy fan, right? And then at a later date, FX, because at this time we didn't have Netflix, we didn't have the DVD sets, we didn't have anything like that, but at a later date, FX started rerunning Buffy and I started setting my VHS recorder to start recording those episodes so I could finally see like how the Buffy stuff started in the television show, right? That's kind of the vibe and feeling that I'm getting here. Not that I'm being filled in on lore that I didn't know, but I'm getting to see almost like the prototypical version of what Transformers is going to become. Now, of course, Bob uh, Budiansky, he winds up becoming the main writer after issue four at issue number five, and he writes this book for a long time. Then Simon Furman comes in. There's this whole thing about Simon Furman who did the Marvel UK versions of this that added material, so that's interesting. I really do hope that Skybound and Robert Kirkman and, and the Energon universe, all that stuff, I hope they reprint these original Marvel books. It may be interesting to see how they can do that in certain things because like in issue three i know that spider-man is there uh freshly in the black costume um but I, I enjoyed this you know it was initially intended to be a four issue series but it went on for 80 issues this went from like 84 to like 92 something like that there was a like a short-lived generation two series i actually got the first issue of that so maybe we can dive into that but i love doing these top down bottoms up videos I want to keep doing them. I know that you guys are liking them, but we need you to share out the word. Let us let everybody know that we're doing it. We're kayfabing it, however you want to talk. But it's me going through comics with you, just chatting and talking about them. And I want to keep going through Transformers. So let everybody know that that's what we're doing. If you want to see more Transformers, let me know. If there's other books you want to see me go through, let me know. If there's certain decades you want to see me go through, we've been doing 70s, 80s, 90s, and modern comics. So... I'm pleased and I'm excited to check this out again. This is truly more than meets the eye. All right, that was cheesy and that was lame, so I'm dipping out. Thank you all so much for checking out the video. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Join us over at patreon.com slash PCP if you want to help support the channel. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Transform, roll out, and station.
Thank you all for being here tonight. We really do appreciate it. We're rolling out, y'all. Let's do it. Right now, hopefully in my hair in my in my head I can hear Leonard Skinner and you can't. I really hope so. YouTube will let me know. I appreciate everybody's comments. I really do. If I leave here tomorrow, would you still remember me? For I must be traveling on now. There's too many places I got to see. But if I stay here with you, girl, things just wouldn't be the same. Cause I'm as free as a bird now. And this bird you cannot change. Whoa, 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 whoa. And this bird you cannot change. Oh, Lord, I can't change. Lord, help me, I can't change. Bye bye, baby. It's been a sweet love. Though this feeling I can't change. But please don't take it so badly. Cause Lord knows I'm the one to blame. But if I st Fuck, I fucked that whole up. I fucked that whole thing up. I can't change. Okay, here we go. Fuck. But please don't take it so badly. Y'all can't hear the music, right? Can I turn it up? <laughs> But if I stay with you, girl, things just wouldn't be the same. Cause I'm as free as a bird now. And this bird you cannot change. Whoa, 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 and this bird you cannot change. Lord knows I can't change. Lord help me, I can't change. Lord knows I can't change I can't change Won't you fly high free bird Alright, 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 alright. I fucked up. 
We could have done that better. We could have done that better. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. All right, for the first time ever on a stream, because I love y'all so much. And, yeah, I finally got my shit figured out so you couldn't hear the actual music going through my headphones. There is a song. <clears throat> Bourbon. Station identification. Bourbon. Where's the station button? All right, so, you know what? I've, I've been drinking enough. We can just break all kayfabe and just fucking talk about this shit, right? All right, so, like, uh, my mother passed away in 2008 when I was, like, 27 years old. And it's a fucking thing I feel every day, right? Every day, every day. And my mom is so important to my life. She was just such a fucking great person. She had her problems. She had her flaws. But she was like the reason why I got into horror movies, right? Like 100%. She's the reason why I got into horror film. And she means so much to me. And I had issues with my mother throughout my life. But in my the the in my twenties, I I really kind of got to know my mother, and and learned a lot about her. And she left us way too early. And one of her favorite bands was Leonard Skinner. And there is a certain song by Leonard Skinner that like I've always wanted to karaoke in honor of her. And I've never been able to do it because every time I hear the song, I kind of like get like really emotional. So I figured, you know what? Fuck it. We're doing it tonight. Because I fucking. Honestly, I hate asking for super chats. I hate asking for people to jump to the Patreon and shit. Unfortunately, it's just something we have to do to keep things going. Right. YouTube's not what it was during the pandemic for sure. And we can have a whole conversation about the state of YouTube at another date. But, like, I really do appreciate the support. And honestly, like, if, you never, if you've never super chatted, don't feel bad. Like, I don't give a shit. Like, at all. I'm going to keep doing what I can do. I just... My mom taught me to, like, I, she wanted... She, my mom told me she just wanted balance. My mom told me... I think that a few years before my mother passed... She knew what was going to happen. And she set me down one day, seriously, and said, when I'm gone, Robbie, if you ever miss me and you want to feel my spirit and you want to feel my advice, listen to this song. 
My mom was a child of the a teenager in the 70s and the early 80s. She loved Leonard Skinner. So, Simple Man is the song that she told me. She, she straight up said, when I'm gone, listen to this song when you want me to be there with you. So, I've always wanted to karaoke the song. <sighs> Let's see if I can get through it tonight, y'all. <clears throat> Here we go. <clears throat> I hate asking for money from y'all. So let me give you something very, very personal is what I'm saying, I guess. Mama told me when I was young, come sit beside me, my only son, and listen closely to what I say. And if you do this, it'll help you. Some sunny day. Oh, yeah. It's for you, Mama. <clears throat> oh, take your time. Don't live too fast. Troubles will come And they will pass You'll find a woman Oh yeah And you'll find love And don't forget son There is someone Up above And be a simple Kind of man oh, Don't you do something You love and understand Be, be a simple Kind of man And won't you do this For me son If you can Don't Forget your lust For the rich man's gold All that you need Is in your soul You do this, oh baby If you try All that I want for you, my son is to be satisfied and be a simple kind of man. Oh, won't you do it? Whoops. Oh, that's right. And baby, be a simple kind of man. Oh, won't you do this for me, son, if you can? Yes, I will. I'm really sorry I fucked up. Damn, some good good guitars on some Skinner, man. I'm not I'm not gonna lie.
But don't you worry You'll find yourself Follow your heart And nothing else And you can do this on baby If you try All that I want for you my son Is to be satisfied I am Be a simple Kind of man Oh won't you dimple something You love and understand Baby be a simple Kind of man Oh won't you do this for me son If you can Baby, be a simple kind of man. Oh, be something. Oh, baby, you love and understand. Oh, baby, be a simple kind of man. And won't you do this for me, babe? If you can I love y'all. Y'all are the best. My mom was the best. You're the best. I wish she could see this right now. I'm not even kidding. She would fucking love this so much. She would fucking love this so goddamn much. All right, enough emotion. I'm out. I love y'all. Have a great week. Weekly comic book review coming up. Spiral tomorrow night on PCP Movie Night. Manny's doing his whole shit. Uh, I'll be on Blood Splatter Chatter, Black Spawn, uh, Black Swan. I'll be on Possession. Y'all, thank you so much for in- indulging me with that. Like that was. That was good. So thank you. Baby, be a simple kind of man. Oh, be something you love and understand. Oh, baby, be a simple kind of man. Oh, won't you do this for me, babe, if you can. It's way better when I don't do it with lyrics, isn't it? <laughs> Station, love y'all. I really, I really do love y'all. Y'all are, y'all keep me, y'all keep it going. Fucking love you. Next week, Easter, Teen Dog Shades Night. That's going to be fun after this. That's going to be great. All right. Um, you are the best.
I want to do it without the, the, the music in my head to see if I can do it just a little bit justice. Thank you all for the comments. That really mean, meant a lot. I'm going to cry after this. Don't worry. I'm going to cry when I get in the car. Mama told me. Well, hold on. That was that was wrong. <clears throat> that was a uh, free bird. Sorry, I just... Mama told me When I was young Come sit beside me My only son And listen closely To what I say and if you do this, it'll help you some sunny day. Oh, yeah. We could all use this advice. Oh, take your time. Don't live too fast. Troubles will come. And they will pass You'll find a woman Oh yeah And you'll find love Yes I did And don't forget my son There is someone Up above And be a simple Kind of man Oh, be something, oh, babe. You love and understand. Baby, be a simple kind of man. Oh, won't you do this for me, son, if you can. Forget your lust. For the rich man's gold All that you need is In your soul And you can do this Oh baby If you try All that I want for you my son Is to be satisfied Baby be a simple Kind of man oh, Won't you do this Oh baby If you can Baby be a simple Kind of man And baby do this Oh baby If you can Boy, don't worry, you'll find your sail, follow you the heart, and nothing else, and you can do this, oh baby, if you try, all that I want for you, my son. Is to be satisfied And then to be a simple Kind of man I oh, want you do this for me son If you can Baby be a simple Kind of man 
I want you to do this for me, baby, if you can. All my mom wanted was for me to find love and be satisfied. She got her wish. Station. 